<laughs> Welcome everybody to the summer series. We are in division C week two, and I'm happy to be joined by co-host Amon Hamilton, Grandmaster from Chesbra, Comma Canada, and <laughs> International Master Rakesh Kulkarni, Assistant Manager of the Mumbai Movers. Hello. Rakesh, thanks for being with us. How My are pleasure. you today? All good. It's almost 7.30 in the evening here. I'm looking forward to the match. All right. So you guys will get in the match before it gets too late. Um, how do you feel about the first week for Mumbai last week? Um, it was almost a perfect week because we scored five points and uh, Amanato's performance of beating Firuja in the knockout battle was really impressive. And we got a bit lucky because Andresian couldn't log in, but right. we'll take what we get. You'll take what you get. You don't mind winning like that. <laughs> no, it, it, was the, it was the first time that Mumbai defeated the Armenia, even yeah. if you include the main series as well. Right. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. They're, they're, their losses are few and far between, the Armenians, actually. So how do you feel about your chances today going up against the Wizards, who set some kind of point-scoring record last week? Are you guys intimidated or optimistic? Um, we uh, we got uh, plenty of members to join last week, so we got the draw odds. But I'm sure that there are plenty of talented Russians, so we need to win on the day and not just on the draw odds. So we also got a couple of title players, and I hope that uh, we uh, match them and at least score a draw in the main match. And mm -hmm. if possible, we also have our Grandmaster, Diptan Ghosh, in the knockout battles as well against uh, Savchenko. So that yeah. should be a good match as well. That's right. Now, Amanatov played superbly last week, obviously. Um, what's the reason for a switch in player when you have a player who's doing really well? Um, you know? I mean, uh, he's, he, we, obviously, we approached him, but he was busy. In fact, okay. the last week he played when he was in between a tournament as well. Okay, so if he'd been willing to just play week after week, you might have uh, considered letting him keep going. Why not? Like, he gave us five <laughs> points. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And um, were you also managing Mumbai during the regular season? Um, I was the assistant manager. A friend of mine, uh, international master Nober Shah Sheikh, was the main manager. Right. But I also trickle in with, because I handle chess.com for India as well, so I like to keep it going. All right. So how would you compare the main season with the, um, with the summer series from, from your perspective within the Mumbai team? Like, is, is, I mean, the, is the managing work different or more fun or harder or what? It's, it's more fun because it's not limited to just 15 or 16 players on your rooster, but it has a wider audience. And it's nice to invite the fans. And even the fans are like liking, retweeting stuff, joining the club because they feel more involved because even they're getting a chance to play tonight and in the matches. Cool. All right. Um, Aman, any? Well, I, uh, I'm looking at this, uh, this match, David, and I, and I see uh, a Moscow team and uh, you know a team from Russia and a team from India and those are two of like the strongest chess countries pretty much yeah. in the world so uh, I'm looking at some of these ratings and uh, you know while one team may be higher rated than the, than the other maybe uh, Rakesh might agree that I think this is probably going to be an incredibly strong match regardless of, of the ratings do you think? Yes, definitely. And uh, what a pleasure to play uh, against Russia on International Chess Day. So that brings us even more joy. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, I think this is going to be one of the most intense club matches we've ever had. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see what else. I saw that uh, India got its 64th Grandmaster a day or two ago. Rakesh, was that uh, something that people at Mumbai on the Mumbai team are talking about? Um, yes, we also have a, a giveaway competition for the uh, India club on chess.com as well, because we have 64 grandmasters now. It's like we almost also completed the chess board of grandmasters, our right. first. And we hope we, we are maybe not even 
a third close to Russia because they they have like 300 of them. Wow. But we are getting there. <laughs> Is there any other country that has more grandmasters than uh, India between you and Russia? Um, yes, I think it's also the US. Ukraine is a small country, but has many GMs and also Germany, I think. Cool. Well, our match starts in one minute. So I guess, uh, I guess we should get set. Anybody who doesn't, or who, who wants to play and isn't already in there, um, needs to hurry. <laughs> starting. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, get get all the guys from Mumbai in, right? <laughs> yeah. Anybody from Mumbai who wants to play and hasn't joined yet, there's the link. And uh, Rakesh, I imagine you'll be watching closely. I hope uh, I hope you enjoy the match and thanks for being with us. Yes, definitely. See you guys. Thanks. Bye. All right, so Aman, there will be action in a few seconds here. Um, it's great to have you back on the PCL Summer Series. How have you been? What have you been up to? Yeah, I uh, well, I actually traveled to Brazil in the meantime, and I played in the Continental Tournament myself, trying nice. to get a spot to that uh, World Cup. So I've, I've been playing actual chess for the last couple of weeks, which is uh, abnormal for me. So Like classical style. I know it's just very strange for me. So I'm, I'm happy to be back here commentating where my moves will not be under scrutiny. I see. And um, you, you run into any capybaras down there? <laughs> uh, I didn't, but I today learned what animal this was. And uh -huh. uh, we, uh, uh, basically to me, it looks like a Latino beaver. And I, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I could resonate with that. You know, it's a Canadian beaver. I thought it was a, a great, uh, great logo. Yeah, so I I think of it as being the largest or one of the largest rodents out there in the world. But um, I also learned something new about capybaras, which is I saw in some comment that a Brazilian player said that it is slang for potzer in uh, <laughs> in Brazilian Portuguese. A, a little double entendre there. Yeah, so it's both a hilarious cute mascot slash giant cute mascot and sort of like a, a joke at themselves. <laughs> I like it. I like Pretty it. That's cool. good. So fan club match underway. I'm clicking on the top board here. People are always going to ask who is Mumbai Movers? Who is Moscow Wizards? Um, yeah. Mumbai Moser, Movers is Deep Tie on Gosh, as the assistant manager was just telling us. And Moscow Wizards is the only player to repeat from last week. That's Boris Savchenko. Right. Yeah. I guess that we were hearing from Rakesh in the interview that it's it's really hard to secure uh, a player, even if he does really well with the team. It's hard to secure them week after week as you know people have their own schedules and whatnot. So uh, Savchenko actually uh, back again. Yeah. So he'll be the one with some uh, experience or familiarity with the format. And I think one game knockouts as a format is pretty new. So it may, <laughs> it may be something that the others have never encountered before. Yep, it's, uh, I mean, the, this type of format really puts the pressure on because uh, you, you can't afford to make mistakes. Uh, that's how it is with, with knockout chess. Um, actually, let me ask you what you think of one other random position that's of interest to me. It's yeah. KRGP. Yep. Against chess player 2093. All right. Chess player 2093 from Germany. I remember him playing for the San Francisco Mechanics. Um, so and that's a good reminder for the fans that they don't just have to play for one club. They can they can shop around. Yeah. So this is an accelerated dragon position that I've seen at some point long ago. And so this like position some, after some move kind of theory, huh? Yeah, this position after move 13, bishop takes d4. Yep. I was looking at this and wondering, like, what is white supposed to do next here? And he ends up yeah. taking him b4, probably out of necessity, it looks like. Right. If he takes on d4 with either piece, then black can play knight c2 check and come out ahead a pawn with the white's king in the center. So basically, basically by force, it seems like black does get a good position with this trap. Right. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. It does look like a, a good position for black. I, I feel like my instinct around move 15, A, a takes B4 might be uh, to, 
to play maybe like queen takes d8 or something like that. I, mm -hmm. I feel like with the queens off the board, I'm a little more, uh, I feel a little better. Um, right. Because leaving the queens on the board, as we've seen in the game, uh, somehow it does, does feel like uh, that benefits black and actually he's won material as a result. Yeah, I mean, it also costs pretty much a full tempo, this putting the queen on e2 just to avoid the queen trade. Maybe if they'd traded here, then the b7 pawn could have been captured with a little counterplay from the a pawn. Mm -hmm. Even as yep. black would have a better position on like the d file and taking c2. But Agreed. as the game went, yeah, b3 was a clever move from black. And uh, now black's just rolling with it. Cool. All right, back to our GMs. Right. Um, and an opening that I know less well than the than that one there. Yeah, I've so. actually seen this uh, uh, a few times in PCL because uh, uh, Eric gets this position with Black uh, a few times against some of the, some of the GMs that he was playing in the in pro league regular season. Okay, uh, so, so I've seen this just uh, by virtue of that, and I was commentating some of those matches. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, I'm more used to it from the Black perspective. But okay. it's it's this uh, opening, I guess, back on move six where. Uh, black takes on a c4, white plays knight a3, and black decides to go c3, which is a uh, right. kind of typical idea to give the pawn back and uh, force white to take. I mean, it kind of looks like, why wouldn't I want to take towards the center, right? Where right. we're always taught like that, just going to strengthen the d4 pawn. But uh, after c5, black gets the counterplay that he wants, where um, if the pawn was, let's say, on b2, maybe a move like d takes c5, uh, would make a lot more sense. Like maybe you could get away with C5. Um, right. With pawns being doubled and isolated on the C file, suddenly that C5 move uh, gives a lot more counterplay. Right. And uh, if black left the pawn on C7 and C4, then white could eventually get some pressure on the C file. So that mm -hmm. would also be a concern there. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the move C3, I've seen it in a couple spots before. And uh, at least also we should tell fans it doesn't lose the tempo because white spends a move on their B2 pawn as well. So sort of like time neutral, just a positional change. Yep. Yeah, no, black is, just because black is initiating it, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, supposedly better or anything for black. I think it's a very balanced position that both both sides are kind of happy to, to take here. Um, but uh, yeah, out of the opening, it looks like he's been spending quite a bit of time on after this move, knight uh, A to C4. Um, mm -hmm. He needs a move here. Uh, the bishop would love to be on B7, but uh, B6 uh, runs runs into knight C6 immediately, and, and we're actually going to be losing a piece uh, after bishop takes D5 there. So we, we wish we could put it there, but I have to say black the way that black's pieces look right now, I... Mm -hmm. I want to, to play like bishop on b7, but I know that I can't. Bishop f5 runs into e4. I feel like I'm almost committed to some sort of bishop on e6 position, which also lends support to the knight. So I'm drawn to that, but then I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, the things to calculate are e4 and, and d5, just like right down the middle of the board. That looks a little bit scary, or at least I would have to calculate. Yeah, just coming right on down e4, maybe knight b6. As you said it, he finally played bishop e6, but... It took uh -huh. him over two minutes yeah. to do that, which is a lot uh, in this time control. So yeah, I could go e4, knight, b6, d5. You had to check on that. That bishop is really low on uh, on squares. On squares, yeah. No, I'm not uh, I'm not liking that. And the other thing about uh, the position is that it almost reminds you of a, a Grunfeld um, in some sense, that if white gets e4, d5, and somehow connects everything with pawn to c4, then it's very good for, for white. So if that ever happens or if white ever plays a4 and stops black from playing b5 it feels like uh, everything i'm seeing seems to be in white's favor um black might have to justify things uh, in a more tactical way mm -hmm. but i'm liking white's position here so uh for gosh to tie in it looks like a good start yeah um and this is a fairly big match as well, like just in terms of the number of players that are participating. I know we've pretty much set record numbers in, in some of the previous uh, matches between clubs, but uh, Russia and, and India, both, uh, you know, fairly good time zones, right? Everybody's, everybody's awake, uh, good, good time of day. And there is a lot of uh, fans competing in this match the, that I see here. Yeah, this match is huge. And Russia, again, has, has a lead. 
right off the bat. Yeah, big lead, actually. Yeah. So it seems like this match has a little bit of a Russian advantage on the lower boards where there were there were more Russian fans waiting to play in the yeah. match. Um, and then on the higher boards, Mumbai had a couple extra 2,100 rated players. So they've got an advantage on some of these higher boards that might go a little bit longer. Yeah, and, and as I was saying uh, at the beginning, I'm really not too sure how accurate these 800 ratings are for some of these like Indian and Russian players. I mean, who knows what's, uh, what kind of talent is lurking behind a rating like that. Yeah. Yeah. In the old days, I mean, you couldn't find a Russian rated 800. That was kind of like a <laughs> joke about Russia, like that your, your cab driver would be better than you if you went to travel to a tournament there. <laughs> um, but, but now with the internet, you know, yep. everybody's got access. I think, I think there may be some actual 800s out there and even in these chess countries. True. Um, yeah, I'm really surprised by Rick AC one, uh, E4, D5 to me was looking really good. Uh, I guess it remains on the table and maybe maybe just nothing changes about the position. It's, it's always there. And if Black plays a move like Knight B6, he's always running into Bishop B7. So it's not like Black has other things he can do. But uh, yeah, I would be a little trigger happy here with White. I, I would be playing E4, D5 probably very, very quickly. And uh, I don't know if I'd have the patience that he's demonstrating right now. I mean, now it might even trap the bishop on e6 to a trade now that the rook's taking up c8. Maybe he thought that black was really just low on space or things to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so he was happy to spend a couple of tempi getting his rooks organized while black's sitting there, as you say, not able to move the knight out of the way of e4 because of b7. Yeah. And also fearing e4 every moment. Yeah. No, I'm. Th this looks like a, I don't know how he's not playing e4, by the way. e4, knight b6. Uh, mm -hmm. D5, um, if bishop D7, maybe I just take on B6 and yeah. you either have, yeah, you have to play A, B6 and then knight D7, queen D7, even something like queen B3 or F4 there. I mean, it's just a tremendous uh, position for, for white. Right. You're playing queen B3, hitting that pawn and wanting to maybe play C4. Yep, um, definitely. I was thinking he might also place queen b3 in the position we have. Just like trying to think what alternatives might there be to definitely playing e4. I was wondering if he maybe wanted to move the queen, introduce rook d1. and I, I think queen b3 is probably also a really good move. Um, the only thing that it allows that's not in the other position, which may be quite annoying, is, um, for example, something like bishop takes e5 i'm not sure if we should play it but there might be a few weird discoveries with the knight if you take back with a knight okay and so bishop e5 i was looking at knight b6 first but bishop e5 first i see yeah so now knight b6 would be positionally first wanna, or after positionally we want to take with the knight and now black could play a move like knight <laughs> i don't know f4, something or knight b4 sure. something Maybe knight crazy or would i think white has the move d5 that he would love to play um yeah. after black does some crazy night move but yeah it just it seems too messy for my tastes uh, yeah and yet i also don't really trust this for black like your d5 move is going to be pretty annoying yeah then, like d5 knight takes back on d5 queen takes on b7 and i don't know no, there's no way that's uh that's good i think your knight b6 initially was probably black has some problems too which threatens bishop e5, for example. Ah, we've got a move. He played queen to a4 here. Not, so, not a fan. Not, I mean, I just, e4, I'm not seeing a refutation to. So, right. Um, not that queen a4 is necessarily a bad move, but I, I just feel like e4 was such a good move. It's like um, he's got a pawn on f6, and he could play queen c1 to h6, and he just keeps preparing it and keeps preparing it. And Amon's <laughs> like, why don't you just do it, man? Yeah. No, this is a, a lot of patience. I, I'm actually, in a way, very impressed. Because the other thing, let's, let's remember, is that his opponent doesn't have many moves. So he's actually yeah. kind of suffocating his opponent in a way, too. The knight on a6 is just terrible. Yeah. Also, an odd thing to note about what White's done is on the last two moves combined, he spent almost four and a half minutes. Yeah. Like a couple seconds, grand. less than four and a half minutes, to put a rook on a random square and, like, you know, lift the queen out of the way of the other rooks. I would say if your plan was to just sort of like 
squish the opponent, you would want to do it a little bit quickly or something, right? So that you're like leaving back with that pressure of like, oh, what's the tension? What do I do? Yeah. Yeah. You can also play a position after e4, d5 very quickly as white. Whereas this position, I think it remains slightly tactical or black always has this idea, let's say the queens get off of just cd4, cd4, and the knight jumps into b4. And all of a sudden black's position might start correcting itself. Yeah, what do you think? Should Black have been throwing in CD4 at some point? Because this whole time we've talked about all the good things White could do, and I still don't really have an idea what Black is hoping for. Well, um, just uh, because it looks like there might be some firm calculation on the table, um, Queen takes E8, Rook takes E8, E4, and now D5 really is trapping that bishop, so to speak. So I'm curious if that's like... right. Does he have to play rook c takes e8? Is my maybe, question. Maybe, maybe there I would try knight takes c3, bishop takes c3, cd4, and then if bishop d4, I'm taking on c4 with my bishop because mm -hmm. d4 is undefended on this diagonal. Does that uh, work out it, for me? I think I think there's some ideas there because let's say I didn't take your pawn right and played like bishop b2 or d2, I mm -hmm. might have some f6 uh, type of type of trickiness right uh-huh so there's definitely something to be said there yeah i mean maybe it's just desperation but that's sort of like what i'm feeling for black is like mm -hmm. before that pawn roller comes i have to look at moves like knight takes c3 yep definitely okay well white played queen a3 keeping queens on the board keeping that tension one nice thing about that is now the bishop's defended so in some of those positions where you want to play d5 he'll be able to follow up with c4 yeah, and I think um, uh, I think this uh, knight c3 move that you mentioned is is really good to notice because it probably was in play in the previous type of lines with e4. Um, I don't know exactly the calculation, but it seems like that's definitely uh, the type of move that you could see White spending like his four and a half minutes on is just really yeah. concerned about this knight c3. Yeah, and actually, I mean, both of these players are investing a lot of time over the last three or four moves. They're down to two or three minutes. Um, here at move 14. So maybe they're both really like looking through some complicated variations. I think so. Th this has got to be one of the slowest uh, moving games that we've seen from some of the top players, right? We're only moving yeah. 14. It was practically in time trouble already. It's almost, uh, I mean, it's basically a, a three minute blitz game. Yeah. In this 10 minute uh, format, in my experience, like nine out of 10 games, one of the players has like, a greater degree of comfort or maybe a small advantage in the opening and is able to play quickly. And the other player is sort of like spending some time trying to deal with it. But there's always at least one player who's sort of confident and happy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, it, I would say that it's white, but the time doesn't necessarily reflect that. Um, and confidence okay. should eventually translate into a time advantage. He's threatening, well, C4, he's preparing. Um, yeah. Makes you so, wonder as black if you should have potentially thrown in that CD4 move earlier so that it wouldn't exist. But right, the problem is this bishop on e6 could even get trapped in some lines. Like I'm thinking b6, c4, queen takes a5, queen takes a5, b takes a5, cd5. Yeah, and I don't really see any future for the e6 bishop at the end. No, it's it's uh it's not looking good there because even if you save your bishop with bishop takes e5, yeah, uh, d takes e5. Um, something like bishop d7. I, I might even be cruel and, and play like, I don't know, a3 or something. Something right. that just make your knight look bad. Just kill that knight. And then, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that concession of bishop takes e5 to avoid losing a piece is just, oh, the white no, bishop no. pair and pawn center and the black queen side pawns. So, and, okay. And what's the, so the time control is 10 plus 2. I just think it's really funny. We're going to get insane time trouble on like move yeah. 15 here. Um, if both players are ticking down. It's a minute and a half apiece. It's basically a bullet game coming up. Maybe he'll play C4. Yep. That's super anti-positional. But yeah, it, really allowing asked. White to play C4 here is kind of <laughs> a positional issue as well. Yeah, C4. And then if E4, Knight B6... At least it yeah. leaves the knight on a5 and the bishop on b2 kind of weird as well. So 
it yep. makes a really messed up position to then just play a bullet game from. Yeah, exactly. That might be the best. And, and e4, d5 is no longer an issue because the knight on e5 is hanging now in all these lines. So that's not a concern. But yeah, these guys are basically so engulfed in the tactics that yeah. could arise. I feel like we may actually get a, a game that's not tactical at all. Like the guys just eventually click into this bullet mode and, and start trusting their intuition because yeah. um, you can't keep calculating everything. You're just going to have to trust yourself and they're running out of time. Yeah, no, I mean, at some point, it's not a classical game, but they're almost playing it like one so far. It's a real mode switch that's coming up. All right, so queen comes back to b6. I guess with the knight on e5 not defended, white still has e4, d5. Maybe knight c4, queen b5, knight a5. That's how often, how often I get disappointed. Like, something seems so tense. I don't know what's going to happen, and then neither of the players do either, so they just right. start repeating. No, we get e4, finally, yes! I was really curious there about the move knight takes c3 since we've been talking about it so much. Yeah. <laughs> it, looked, uh, it looked like maybe that, was, well, maybe that was the moment for it. Knight c3, bishop c3, cd4, everything's hanging. And queen c3, cd4, queen d4, queen a5. Yep. Maybe we'll take that way. Yeah, if he uh, slips away one way, you get him the other way. Okay, this is definitely wrong i would say but uh, e4 here this looks almost like the, the restraint on this guy not playing the move d5, d5. is truly impressive yeah <laughs> it's blowing my mind it's world record restraint and they, they are playing bullet everybody they have yeah, these guys are playing bullet now they have 40 seconds here here okay. goes c4 okay c4 yeah or e5 sorry you can play e5 as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure e5 there was uh, was playable. Black would have to go yeah. like knight g4, and I wasn't sure about the move like e6. So I, yeah. I'm not sure if he missed a chance to get e5 in early. I think he can still play e5. At white's position yeah. is extremely, extremely good. All right, he played rook b1. There's uh, not much wrong with that either. Black is no. pretty smushed, in my opinion, Amon. Yeah. Like the long term <laughs> prospects. Yeah. I don't know, man. So here basically, yeah, he's stopping knight g4 to play e5. In a bullet game, this is a disaster position because you know long term that the pawn on a2 is gonna sneak its way to a3 and yeah. really disturb your your beautiful knight on then you'll have nothing left in the entire world, <laughs> basically. And knight f4 is played because he wants he doesn't even want to let that knight trade now with his big space advantage. Makes sense. That h3 move, too. He is so patient, even in a bullet game. That's yeah. how he plays, man. <laughs> b5 is great. Uh, b5 is how you want to play. Yeah. Um, so he's starting to get loose here in this position. I think that's correct. Maybe, okay, he takes. And he's going to go for it. Knight on g4, queen sliding over. It looks like a good attack. Yeah. Yeah, knight g4. Yeah, and, and you can almost think about it. Rook takes d4 in, in some lines just to sort of keep the, the pieces on. Queen f3. Queen's coming. It's time for the queen. Man, he's somehow been forced to sack like three pawns here. But yeah. <laughs> can anyone keep his queen and knight at bay? Knight h6, queen h8 wins the rook. So he's playing king f8 preemptively. So that's what? Queen what? D4. What? Um... That's bullet style. <laughs> well, first of all, it's just a little funny that black played rook takes d4, right? Because then, for example, if white was still playing the game, I mean, knight h6 and knight e5 are both still extremely difficult to deal with uh, for black. So right. I don't know why he didn't play queen takes d4. Queen takes but... d4 <laughs> defending his dark squares. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what just happened. All right. Would be, we would be right to imagine that if knight h6 had been played, uh, white would have still... Oh, I think Been White winning. was winning. I think White was winning. Yeah, like e6 is dead. Queen h8 is coming. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the wow. real issue is that like after knight h6, I don't I can't think of a move for black. Um, and right. Brook or Bishop takes e6 is gonna be lights out, I think, with Queen H8. That was almost a perfect game by Deep Tion until he missed like the Queen thing. Yeah, you know what's weird about that, uh, David, is that um I don't even support the idea of rook takes d4 if the queen was not on a7. 
So right. I just feel like the move is misguided, even if it works. I, I just think Knight H6 and, you know, play with the initiative that he's been playing with the last 10 moves. It's a bullet game. He's been sacrificing. Oh, it was a great game, but just keep that up for a couple more moves and it looked like lights out. Yeah. All right. Well, instantly on to the next one. And uh, we've got this E takes F6, Carl Kahn. Um, almost never played in uh, classical tournaments like where you were just playing, but a very frequent visitor to online chess. Yeah. This opening. It's a, uh, it's a slight uh, advantage for white. And it, it's almost, um, I just like to call it the, um, the, I don't know, the cousin of uh, the Berlin defense or something. It's right. pretty much the exact, if you flip the board, it's like, um, the exact structure where you have this quote unquote extra pawn on the queen side mm -hmm. um, for white, and you want to pretend that, that that's uh, you know a serious advantage, and that later on you might be able to in an end game maybe have a pass pawn your opponent can't. But at the same time, these these pawns on the king side resemble those uh, in the Berlin where they just control so many squares and and afford like knight on f3 is just dominated here by by the pawn on f6 very nicely. And yeah, that's why this position is generally about uh, about equal. And uh, yeah, it just looks like a reversed uh, Berlin in some ways. Yeah, and in this opening, I mean, black very often goes for control over d5 and c4. Um, and I think also in the Berlin, you see various different kinds of blockading ideas for black on the king side where they're down a pawn, but there are all sorts of different ways the four versus three can get set up where black finds room for their pieces Yeah, on blockading posts. Yeah. Um, I mean, he didn't want to ever play bishop takes e6 as well, because maybe black would simply play f takes. Uh, that's always an idea. Um, knight takes is also fine, but if black can play f takes e6, it's really, you struggle to find an advantage in these types of uh, positions where uh, you don't even have an extra pawn on one side of the board. Right, you don't even have anything to tell yourself when you're trying to like get <laughs> hyped for your own yeah. advantage. Exactly. Right. Um, we're going to take a really short break here, Amon. So um, everybody, bear with us. We'll be back in a moment to see the rest of the second uh, round of the uh, Moscow Wizards versus Mumbai Movers fans. So don't go anywhere. Stay with us. We're back. Don't think you had enough time to miss us. And uh, the Moscow Wizards are opening a 15-point lead against the Mumbai Movers fan club, um, which is relatively close after what we saw last week where Moscow won by 50 points. Wow. Yeah. No, a 15-point yeah. lead in a match with so many matches actually still in play uh, could completely swing the other way. There's no indication that, that uh, it's going to keep going up. Yeah. And to some extent, uh, the Moscow team has been winning a lot on the lower boards and the Mumbai team has been winning a lot on the higher boards. Um, so it can depend how many more games are left at the top versus the bottom, maybe. Yeah. Um, I was just watching Jain Kashish here showing some rook endgame technique. 
Um, yeah, doing it beautifully. And uh, yeah, he uh, he did a great job of this one. He had an extra bishop, but a black G pawn that couldn't be stopped. So he set the whole thing up to eventually win, win it in the rook end game. Very nicely done. Um, and I thought this was a good moment to check out some other players' games because, um, because the uh, the game between Savchenko and Gush I expect to be a somewhat long one. So, yep. but if we're ever going to see someone else, now would be the chance. Um, I see uh, if you scroll down the uh, the list, uh, I, I see there's um, Miss Lova Lova is playing uh, Gold Dust Story. <laughs> and uh, the, ah. they, they're sending a chess.com staff after the uh, after uh, Tori, who, uh, to yeah. my understanding, is uh, streaming her uh, perspective as well. All right. So looking at this position, it's pretty exciting. It looks like... Uh, Looks like Miss Lava Lava has gone for an early peace sack. Yeah, what's that rook doing on G6? What's going on here? Looking for mate. Oh, man. Looking for mate. All right, the sack comes on move seven. And uh, yeah, Bishop takes H3 or H6 in like a bullet game is almost like a no-brainer. It's like always worth it. In a blitz game, pretty much also always okay to just trade a piece for two pawns, it becomes so hard for the other person to play it. Yep. So yeah, no, the, these are always tricky. The thing about attacks is like, once you fend off the initial attack, like she played queen f3, stop that yeah. checkmate on g2, it's it's not over, right? You're not out of the woods. Black is going to like long castle and play knight f6, knight g4, and knight e5's in the air, so it's, it's not over yet. There will sort of, to some extent, always be a degree of counterplay here. Yep. Um, from black uh 95 would be really devastating in some sense if not for queen takes b7 um and it, you know castling queen side doesn't really if queen b7 is a problem right yeah i think here uh bishop d6 is is now quite a big threat right if black could make two moves bishop d6 in this current position would actually be um well i don't know about game yeah. over but it'd be very close uh close to yeah it. Seems pretty much like it would be. So options for white include like king h1, bishop d6, queen h3. Mm -hmm. um, because bishop right now queen h3 would just lose the queen. And bishop f4 when they have to worry about rook f6, which uh, Lava Lava seems to have seen that coming and uh, played it very quickly, rook f6 here. Yeah, I think uh, um, white will do quite well after um, playing bishop g3 here. And sort of any type of queen for queen exchange is always going to bet Ooh, probably the wrong one there right idea totally the right idea actually yeah to, to use the discovery so close but just had to go to g3 because now black will say okay queen takes g5 you haven't you still got your queen under attack and that's just a free bishop for me yeah yeah because now the problem is hang on a sec i still have all this attack but now the material is even so now now you got to watch out yeah so bishop g3, black probably still would have played queen back to g5 or something and then tried to keep attacking sort of more yeah, slowly at, with bishop d6 or h4. At least uh, bishop g3, queen uh, g5, there might be like knight e4. And it's like you're, you're, you're looking for yeah. all the bailout options to just yeah. get those queens off the board. That's what you have to do, folks. You got to think like I'm on if you want to get out of one of these attacks. I know pretty much every one of you has had somebody play bishop takes h3 or h6 against you at some point. This, yep. this happens. So now you know what you need to look for. You need to look for some like concrete tactics, some peace trades. Because to defend your king against an attack for like 20 moves, almost <laughs> nobody's going to pull that off. Yeah, you got to play very accurately. And I, I'm not in the mood to play accurate moves, so I just try to trade the pieces off and make my life right. easier. Yeah. Better to find like two or three really good moves right at the beginning than to like try and find good moves for 20 moves long. <laughs> yep. All right. Anu Palm 2008 in the chat is saying that he's done his job. He scored two points, two and zero for the Mumbai movers. Oh, Anu Pam. If I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, I think Anu Pam is, uh, is a girl. Anu Pam was in my chat earlier while, while I, when I was streaming. Ah. And uh, oh, two. Oh, oh, man. We got some. Uh, some people who've been training in the uh, the chess bra arena there. Uh -huh. So this is a chess bra trainer. 
Nice. That's, and uh, um, great. and they've cut the they've cut the lead to ten points, which is for the Moscow players. I mean, razor thin. Maybe they're getting nervous. They're like we've never not been up by thirty points. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, the scores continue to update as as um, you know. The, the second game starts to finish. And as you pointed out, the trend we've been noticing is big scores for Moscow on the lower boards um, and big scores for uh, the movers on the higher boards. So it's just not as many players uh, showed up for, for Mumbai today. And Moscow is, is sort of using the uh, numbers advantage tactic. Just get more people uh, is going to cause more problems. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we heard we heard from the assistant manager Rakesh that they managed to recruit a few titled players, so they've got some, you know, national master level players on their top boards from Mumbai, and and they're delivering a good number of points. <clears throat> right. But that advantage of players, as you say, just means that like at the end, the Moscow Wizards fans who are rated like 800, 900 didn't get to play, and the 800s and 900s from Mumbai have to face you know 1,300 players from Moscow, which it's hard <laughs> tough down there yeah absolutely um i think that uh just looking at a few of these games near the near the top um there's one game between rocks uh, 6789 and uh kaivalia 2007 um i think yeah. it's five and yeah this one is uh well currently uh white is down a, a piece but the actually we're tuned in when pretty much every single thing is hanging. F7 yeah. is hanging, C6 is hanging, A6 is hanging. And uh, after losing the first game, it actually looks like uh, this would be a big win for Moscow. It'd be one of the few uh, points that they've scored on the, the higher board. So really yeah, geez. absolutely. It looked like Bishop E8 was pretty much forced and that's what Kaivalya chose. I don't know if you saw a better option for him than that. No, um, no, I didn't. Unfortunately, F7 had to be defended, no question, because that would lead to a checkmate, probably. I mean, if he could play queen takes B4 here, then you could try to defend four on three on the king side. But with the knight on F6 hanging, it looks like it looks like White's pretty much going to have a winning position after queen D8. Is there some other alternative here? Yeah, I, I wish that I could get this queen F2 move in, but the problem is rook F6, bishop B5, my F7 square is is not protected. I've been looking at queen f2, uh, rook f6, bishop b5, queen f7, king h8, <laughs> trying to dream of like making that right. work. But uh, it seems like nonsense. Bishop takes b5 at the very least. Uh, unfortunately, the bishop defends himself at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> the intended victim on f1. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, and then it, then it all peters out, and suddenly white has got six pieces all over the board. <laughs> yeah. I don't even want to count them. So yeah. Yeah, like Queen D8, like you said, and, and uh, as long as White uh, doesn't have time issues or let that Queen sneak into F2 uh, safely, I think this right. is a big big position for Moscow and maybe much needed points scored on one of the top boards here. Yeah. Wow. He must have uh, he must have done something nice there to get that position. So on move 23, C5, D takes C5, Knight E5. And then on C4, having knight D takes C4 coming. That was really well planned. Yeah, yeah, knight D takes C4. And I mean, it comes off the back of bishop F1 on move 22 and crazy G5 move. Black was going G5, G4 and trying to undermine. And white decided to punish that immediately. So I, I like yeah. it. I like the quick reaction to one of these wow. abrasive G5 Yeah, moves. black was just a little too confident there, thinking like he's going to undermine the whole structure with G4. Yep. Uh, but oh, this great. c5, this is really a strong move. After white takes on e5, they're threatening f7. So black could have played bishop e8 right away. But then, you know, maybe white would play bishop takes b5 in response. Maybe just trade on c5 is good enough. Yeah. So black relies on c4, but obviously he'd seen that coming. So a good piece of calculation there. Well, let's check back in on our GMs because um, their game has definitely developed. Yeah, as you predicted, sort of a longer, a longer struggle here. Um, again, I, I like the way that, uh, that black has handled the game so far. I think, uh, he's going to have easy moves to play coming up, uh, such as H5, G5 potential to expand. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you ever take on E4, black can always play F takes. Um, 
there's always going to be tricks in the position like knight takes g3 so you kind of have to watch that bishop on e3 with your rook um like for example like yeah rook d1 or, or rook uh rook b1 to to play on the other side of the board can't always be played and black has you know moves like just a6 king f7 sort of slow moves that that he can uh, always always get out there so black still seems quite comfortable i would say uh i'd say especially sort of getting low on time i think black's position is uh very comfortable to play uh if black would play something like knight on e4 takes on d2 and white plays king takes d2 then i start to, to feel like that's a position where uh where white could succeed but okay you just played the move i was going to ask you about I was going to say the way I approach a position like this is I just start calculating a couple like moves mm -hmm. and the move I start with is C4. If I'm trying to understand what's going on, I ask myself, what happens if we play C4? Yeah, it's a good one to start with. Um, and it's just the best way to calculate, I think, is to start with the most forcing moves. Uh, mm -hmm. A5, by the way, is, is almost necessary. I think I would play potentially A6 here uh, as black. Mm -hmm. And look to play, honestly, bishop b8, bishop a7. I think a5 was played to stop bishop b6. Um, as you see, he immediately reroutes the knight. This is the downside of playing c4 and why I would be very, very hesitant to do so. Uh, not only does black threaten the d4 pawn now, but he's threatening f4. And f4 is very disturbing to face because it, you, you actually don't want to take this pawn at all. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd love to play the move f4 as white here. And this d5 move, I'll tell you right now, that is desperation. Okay. So c4 was a bad idea, and we just learned why. Yeah, I think uh, the game remains ongoing, but I have a feeling that this position um, definitely favors, favors black. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see some, some GM cleverness in what white's doing with a bad situation, I think. Like, yep. he's not just going to sit there and play like knight to b3 or f3 and let black play a6 bishop a7 instead he finds this moment where he can take on a7 he avoids that f4 thing from yep. being as big a problem he's looking to maybe play bishop b6 at some point and sort of change the nature of the game yeah i think uh one move i wish i could play is almost c5 as white and look to sort of play with compensation and have like a three on one a sack the rook on a1 Mm -hmm. uh, if black would play bishop takes a1 i'd say thanks very much you know take play bishop b6 i think really good compensation but the problem is sure. knight b4 check indeed and, and if i play king anywhere i think knight c6 or knight b5 follows and that that unfortunately doesn't look good. yeah we're gonna lose our exchange in a much badder way <laughs> yeah yeah much more bad so much bad all right so um yeah i mean that that would be a good desperation idea but it's not going to work out here instead the rook comes to the c file that makes sense since that could be opening up and yeah this four. is uh this is tough here for him because there's a few things to deal with king b1 yeah if you, basically the options to not take king d1 looks insane to put your king on a d file with the rook on d8 yeah let's look Probably. no further let's try king b1 like you were also going to say yeah and and there the other issue is that um something like either knight c6 forcing bishop c5 because uh, the b pawn is hanging um or just d takes c4 maybe in some order those moves and again those pieces on the d file just look loose mm -hmm. one of them is going to fall i think right and some yeah i think the knight c6 is a good move to throw in and then take on c4 and ugh, yeah that seems pretty clear well uh -oh. he, he's got his uh, three on one. So I have to say that's that's definitely good. But the problem is black has the two bishops. Yeah. And that bishop posting up on like e5 or something is going to you know, guard everything. And you know, it says white. I think you might just run out of pawns here. Well, yeah. I mean, he's going to play at least two pawns down, right? So then... Yeah. Um, I mean, assuming black can play bishop takes g3 here, which, you know, seems yeah. okay. The only thing is that it, is good. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking... Um, at least to consider rook b8, just because uh, bishop g3 lets the pawn sort of mobilize slightly, b5, and get going. Mm -hmm. um, whereas bishop on f2 is actually stopping the pawns from moving. White would prefer b5, b6 to b5, c6, I think. Right. So on rook b8, white might have to play c6, mm -hmm. um, since they can't really defend b4 very well. And yeah. this at least stops rook b4 because of c7. So then you would play bishop takes g3 there, probably. Let's see. 
Oh, he just played the simple bishop takes g3 in the game. He didn't. He, yeah, he, and bishop b7, surprisingly, he, he goes for this one. I don't necessarily believe it. Um, I think he wants to go b5, b6, and then c6, c7. So kind of slow. Uh, but black's pawns are not dangerous yet. So No, they're going to um, take a while. Well, they are going to take a while. <laughs> Here they start. No, we said they're going to take a while, but uh, after g5, he takes h4. I mean, <laughs> how long are they going to take? That pawn's pretty quick. So we're getting to h2 already. Yeah. Four messed up pawns rolling down the board. Yeah. Nine seconds for Savchenko. F4, yeah. No, this because that fourth threat is for e3, and the pawns are not moving on the queen side. So it seems uh, it seems we're gotta be knight d4. Yeah. yeah. Gosh is reasserting some dominance after that uh after that game where he hung the queen while winning. I think bishop uh... just back to f7. <laughs> just <laughs> Rook to bishop, e bishop Rook to e6 uh, to e4 looks good. Rook to e4. And I guess you can just... Oh, you can't just take it. No, it'd be oh, nice right. if you could just go to e1. Rook e1, rook e1, bishop e1, bishop d5, f3. Yep. Is that? Yep. Or f3 first, but uh, pretty much the same idea. I think rook e1 now might be the, the move. Oh. What was that? Well, he's doing it in a really weird way, I have to say. Now his king starts moving. Wait, what's going on? Okay, there it is. <laughs> oh, he didn't like knight f5 check, and knight takes g3. And knight takes g3. Oh, good call. But this is awful. What is this? B bishop uh, g4, and then... Bishop f3, huh? Six. Well, something to e6. And white's queening. Okay. I mean, so... worst case, white could play bishop takes f3 first, right? And then... No, but I think that I think he's playing for the win. I think I think he's uh, going you think for he's a got mate. mate here. Uh, I don't think it's there, but it, he wishes. Yeah, because the king's coming to h six. Yeah, he wants check on f four. Because bishop takes f three definitely was was winning too. I think this is very close to winning. I want to say he's got to play king g five. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Continuing mm -hmm. on the attack here. Uh oh. Oh, it's so close, but I don't think it is. Queen h4? No, yeah, you have to be careful. <laughs> four. Seems good. I'm worried about like bishop d3 and and then bishop e4 discover check and well, my queen is free. <gasps> and then you have to come back to e2. Yes, and, and then, then queen, queen d3, queen f3, <laughs> two. Oh my lord, okay. Okay. That's how you can lose on the spot. At queen yeah. h6 looks like you lose the same way, by the way. Bishop e4 here? Bishop e4. This is mate. Uh, this must be mate. Queen a1 and then queen b2. And then, yeah, queen b2, king e3, queen, queen c1, right? He's done it. There it is. Oh, yeah, he just got mated. Wow. He completely messed that up. Wow. Yeah, Did Sevchenko that... just save like two lost positions in bullet? Yes. He well, did, I right? mean, I mean, the last one, uh, I would say he didn't so much save as as gosh, really, really messed up. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, no, he 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 hung in both positions, and he pretty much was the opportunistic uh, guy in this match. He yeah. just took what he was given. Wow. So, okay, this position that we were talking about with the pawn on f3, bishop on d5, the concern was that rookie one would allow knight f5 check, mm -hmm. king moves somewhere, and knight takes g3, covering h1. Right. Yeah, and unfortunately... Not clear how to ever win this for black, actually. Yeah. I don't Even with the other pawn coming to f2. Uh, although I can say that I'm 100% convinced uh, what, what what was that line that uh, we had at some point uh, with F3, and then he played F3, and we said, oh, maybe it's the same? But you had a line with a different move followed by F3. Right. I think it was the same as... To, oh, well, mine was to play rookie one before F3, and actually in that position, knight F5 to G3 doesn't really matter, does it? Exactly. 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 So I prefer yours. So what about knight rookie one first? Right. Knight F5, king G6, let's say. 
And then if Knight takes G3, F, G3, rookie one, G2, mm-hmm. and then just exactly. G1. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, it, I was it was winning. It was winning. He could have just queened his pawns. Right. Right. This rookie four was actually a, a, such a crucial tempo. Um, the other thing about rookie four is that even after rookie four and then rookie one, I think it was, it was correct, but he had this idea that F3 first was, but the F3 move gave knight F5 check and then all, all the variations don't work anymore. So mm-hmm. that was suddenly the, it didn't work. He threw in this and now there's always knight F5. So then, damn. Yeah. <laughs> you got the king off of knight E6, but onto off of knight F5, but onto a square where there's like, check when the c pawn queens like even king f8 if it had gone to g6 maybe right at least there's no at least black gets the queen first hang on we should check who's winning this match too since that's what a lot of people are going to be curious about moscow wizards 63 mumbai movers 42 20 yeah. point lead and i want to say less than 20 very play, yeah it's got to be less than 20 there. going now might be close but again yeah i think moscow I think. wins this match Probably, probably. The um, highest rated game ongoing seems to be between a Drinking Man and Jesur Majidov. Yeah. Um, oh, Majidov, I saw him play last week. And to be honest, it, it, I think that it is drawn, although I would be really interested in mm-hmm. playing G4 with white in the right moment. Yeah. I think the king on C5 invading the B6 is... Uh, is really dangerous. So maybe uh, put a rook on... So king on c5, forces rook p8, then put a rook yeah. on like probably h2, and then h2. play g4. Yeah, one rook on e3, one rook on h2. Seems right. Uh, you want the e pawn defended, so if black plays fg4, you can roll with f5 right away. Yep. And, and you want a motor behind the h pawn if they play hg4. Mm-hmm. So here, he should just be putting that e1 rook on h1. All right, he's got everything set to try it, if he's going to try it, 19, 18. Do it. There it is. Yes. All right. I like the energy. Rook h6. Now on rook h6, we still need some more energy, huh? Oh, oh he's really? allowing king b6, and then right. he gets counterplay with c5. Maybe he wants yeah. to do that. All right, threatens h6 again. King b6, I guess he's going to go for it now. c5 takes, yeah. Yes, c5, king c5, rook c8. Ooh, king takes oh. a6 is a scary king move to play. King c7. King c7. This is just, this is just going to be mate. Because now king c7 and then rook a8 and rook a6 mate. Oh my goodness. Our plan was a suicide. Amon. Rook A8, unstoppable. Oh no. <laughs> oh, Rook A8 is nice. Oh, okay. This one doesn't sack a Rook, so it's obviously worse. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. This was like. Man. Well, we approved Jasur, but uh, I guess. I, re- I respect it. I respect it. Yes, it shouldn't have been done. And Moscow wins by 22 points. Last so week, they won by for them. 50 points. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they scored 79 and a half points in a match of similar size. So um, overall, I think the Mumbai Movers fan club showed up quite well this week. And I will be betting on them again next week uh, when they don't have to play Moscow. And uh, we're going to take a short break before the knockout phase, everybody. We'll be back in a couple minutes with um, four grandmasters and uh, a knockout brawl. Yeah.
Welcome back, everybody. We are getting ready for the knockout phase here. Amon, uh, were you surprised by the result in this uh, massive fan club match between the Wizards and the Movers at all? Uh, surprised by the final result, I, I can't say I was because I think that although the Movers were, uh, I don't know about favorites, but they were definitely top heavy in terms of their lineup. Um, I think that it's really valuable in these club matches to have depth. And showing it, I think that the team that shows up with more players generally has the advantage because uh, you end up pairing, you know, the lowest rated players, some 800s, 1000s, with potentially some 1500s on, on the, uh, the opposing team if you have lots of players that are showing up. So mm -hmm. I think for that reason, uh, I think that the Moscow Wizards were always favorite uh, as soon as I saw how many players showed up for each. So uh, 64 to 42, not surprised by the result. However, there were definitely some surprising games that, that we were able to witness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there were some moves that shocked you, like uh, Rook takes D4 um, in the very first game we watched. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if you believe in curses at all, but uh, I, I do remember you doing something with your beard at some point <laughs> in, in your life. Uh, there have been two divisions before this division C and in division a San Francisco took the lead in the first week with five points out of six. They went on to not make the summer series championships. They didn't finish in the top two. And then in division B, the uh, Barcelona Raptors took the lead with five out of six in the first week and then did not make the summer series championships either finishing outside of the top two last week, the Mumbai movers took the first place spot with five points out of six. And now they've lost this club match, and they're going to need deep tie on Gush to yeah. hold it together if they want to avoid the same slip. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds a little ominous now that you put put all the stats out there like that. Uh, if I was playing on one of these teams, I would hope to just uh, not uh, not hear that news. Um, okay, and, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't the... want to know what was what exactly. was what was out there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw Gosh um, play two sort of dominant opening middle games, um, and get zero points out of it, and that's not going to fly in the knockout. I mean, Mumbai is absolutely going to need some point here if they don't want the other teams to pass them to pass them up this week. Yeah, I I hope that he's uh, sort of used those games as a as a warm up um, because. Uh, Let's say if we look at the match overall, uh, those wins against the uh, Moscow Wizards, if Gosh Tain was able to pull them off, wouldn't have changed the outcome of the match. But right. now uh, his results very directly contribute to how many points they walk away with today. So th in all honesty, these are the ones that, that matter. Yeah. And um, the way I saw today's matches partly was like the first match between Moscow and Mumbai since they had both won their club matches in the first week. Um, I was kind of seeing it as like whichever team won that match would definitely make the summer series championships. Right. Um, so I think that the wizards, I mean, I'm sure they haven't like clinched it mathematically, but I think that they're looking very, very, very good to make the summer series championships at this point and to take likely first place in their group. Yeah. Um, all right. The knockouts underway and, uh, The, uh, the format here, everybody, is going to be a 15-minute game with two-second increment. And uh, it's a, a one-game knockout. So if, uh, if the Capybaras player here, uh, which is Sandro Mareko, yep. uh, if the Capybaras player here wins this game, then uh, the match is already over, and he goes to the finals of the knockout. Wow. Yeah. So the time control is actually more comparable to the um, regular season of the PCL. Um, so that's what these players will actually be used to. Um, this was, they've been playing it all season. And most, if not all of these guys have played a significant number of games for, for their teams. I know, I know Mareko is uh, um, quite, quite active. I think Mareko played previously in the PCL uh, yep. for the Buenos Aires Krakens. Uh, that's right. Um, were they, were they in the same division as the chess bras and they, they were yeah we played against them that's, that's why i remember yeah yeah so moreco did not play in the main season this year um but uh in the previous year he had played in the previous two years um 
yeah it played um and uh he's a 26 40 or 50 fide yeah quite a strong and, player i actually yeah. saw him uh when i was in brazil uh he wasn't playing in the tournament actually but he was just hanging around um so he uh, he was there and i see uh sao paulo uh cafe barras here it's that's exactly where i just was so uh yeah maybe, yeah. maybe a bit of bias here who knows yeah, maybe he was there to to hang out with his team a little bit. Um, yeah, I find I find it's extremely fun to go to a chess tournament and not play. Yeah, it's uh, you, you don't realize how um, much of a de stressor it is to attend, but but not play. It's really great. Yeah. So um, yeah, so he's got white here, Moscow Wizards. If you're if you've been in the show. You, you already know that that's Boris Savchenko, if you're new. Boris Savchenko here um, is the one player who played last week. And uh, last week, he lost in the first round and won in the second round to take third place in the knockout and score a point for the Wizards. Yeah. Yeah, the points at stake, uh, uh, David, remind us. Yeah, uh, three points to the first place player, two points to the second place player, and one point to the third place player, nothing to the fourth place player. So it's possible to just sort of get blanketed for a week, have one of those zero out of six weeks. Yeah. Um, not really possible to make the playoffs if you do that, but. Uh, and the points, um, is it uh, two points that uh, Moscow just claimed for winning the fan match? Three points. Three points. Okay, so they could walk away with, uh, um, with at least, let's say, uh, five points if, uh, if he wins. Uh, yeah. Here right now that's right and that might even be enough to clinch the playoffs for them i don't know the first week yep. they had four points probably not yet but get in there yeah yeah i think in the other groups uh team some teams depending on how competitive the divisions are how close they are uh nine points has been enough to to go through so um yeah depending on the group that that could be enough yeah so um what do you think of this opening if the pawns were on h2 and h7, it would be a very, very normal uh, English opening. Yeah. Yeah, both uh, sides are electing to plant that bishop there and say, oh, you don't have h3, you don't have h6, so I'm going to leave my piece there and you can't do anything about it. Uh, the moves f3 and f6 are kind of not very desirable. Uh, White's position always feels easier to play to me with moves like bishop e3, knight e4, um, just really easy attack on the c pawn there uh, yeah. but black has a move right now which i think is a very crucial one uh because white sort of couldn't proceed with all these ideas of uh winning a c pawn because the king was sitting on e1 and you never want to go for too many uh, middle game plans or, or start thinking ahead before you get that king to safety so he had right. to castle and now black's going to take that time to go knight d7 and if knight e4 i think he just wants to play uh maybe b6 Hope the white has enough knights on the uh, on the long diagonal that he can get in b6, yeah. and then rook c8. And if black's able to play both those moves, then the opening is at least not a disaster. Yeah, yeah, that looks uh, that looks yeah. like it should be okay. One of the ways that white can get out of the way very quickly though is knight h2. Knight h2, hitting the bishop, and also clearing the way for the other bishop. So. There might be some actual discoveries like knight takes c5, for example, maybe trying to win some material on the lines yeah. that we're looking at. Wow, look, white's looking at something similar mm -hmm. um, from a different angle. If b6 in this position, then knight h2. Mm -hmm. And if black moves away the bishop on g4, say yeah. to e6, then there's knight e7 check as a tactic. Yeah, knight e7, knight e7, bishop a8. Um, I start to wonder about f. Six yeah, there. F six could could rain on that parade. Yeah, but the the yeah. thing is, you're you're already right that after knight h two, bishop e six. I mean, the move knight f four is also a tremendous move. Um, just That's a simpler, shattering. tremendous move. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not winning anything. So if if uh, tactically uh, your your knight e seven works, definitely prefer to play that. But otherwise, yeah. it's nice to have a backup, right? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like the knight e seven doesn't work there. Okay, so rook c eight was played. That seems definitely the safer approach there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start with that one so there's no tricky moves. Um, and he's trying to say that, yeah, basically, 
the e pawn can't move. So I'm going to just leave my knight on this d5 square. Basically, can't yeah. be touched. Uh, then I have d7 moves. C5 always hangs. E pawn's pinned. Uh, maybe as black, you sort of play b6 here and just keep um, keep shoring up your position or yeah, making these sort of useful moves and letting your knight move to f6 maybe next. Yeah, it's a little odd to me to see the sort of dangly knight on d5. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's sort of sort of making it work, and uh, Savchenko's tired of it too. Mm, knight b6 looks uh, suspicious to me. The first move I consider is maybe three here. Okay. Um, and... Looking at two directions at a time. Very nice. Yeah, I guess the other one. Yeah, a knight e3 would definitely be one of my one of my top moves. Uh, I'm not sure how black is dealing with things like if he's taking on f3 or mm -hmm. if he's going to somehow let knight takes g4 happen and take with the pawn, but that looks like a no. Right, like trying to defend the c pawn and allow knight g4. Right, yeah, it seems wrong. I'm not sure. He, he very quickly sort of didn't play knight e3, so I, don't know, I feel like there might have been something more to that. Knight c3. Huh. Well, d5 was a fleeting joy, and now it's gone. I guess he's threatening knight e4 again, so Black's got to get go ready. He's got to get ready for b6 again. Maybe he played this move quickly because he's expecting knight d7, knight d5. He's just pulling a little, like, put some time pressure on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, already I can say that the pace of this game is, is, if you just think back to our, I mean, it was a different time control, 10... 10 minute game previously yeah. between the wizards and the Mumbai movers. Uh, the pace was still faster, uh, it right. was much faster. And the other one being a 10 minute game would have just been a reason for them to play faster, not slower. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, let, let's pop over to the other board for a second, just see what kind of opening we've got there. Yeah. Um, all right. Another positional opening from, from gosh. Um, Looking pretty, looking pretty comfortable for both players. Actually, I think uh, Teresa Hockian's fine. Yeah, I I think um, in these positions, all you need to look for is um, uh, I just take a look at that knight on d6, and I can already say that black black is definitely better here. Um, knight on d6 is so phenomenal because uh, one of the main plans is to play b4 b5. But this knight sits on d6, it covers b7. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's not always the case that bishop sits on c8. So sometimes white has like a queen on b3, queen on b4. Knight on d6 covers everything. Hits the, the b5 square, watches the c4 square, which is if you play b4, sometimes... You play the, b4 at the wrong time, uh-oh. Yeah. Comes in. Um, and it's just so such an easy position for black to play. Uh, Black's going to follow up with rook d8. Um, g6, king g7, maybe bishop f5 or knight f5 in the right moment, um, hd4 in the right moment. I, I think that this e pawn is just going to be a uh, clear target for the rest of the game. Yeah. So actually, Gosh is in some trouble already. I mean, the position's more pleasant for black. Yeah, I think no question about it. If you take a look at that time, I think it reflects the, the comfort level. Um, so wow. great, great position to start off with uh, uh, for Armenia here, in my opinion. So the rest of us need to start bringing our knights to d6. Is it that is like any position with the knight on d6 pretty good in this queen's gambit exchange? Well, it's uh, if you think of um, the the London system uh, reversed, so you kind of get that structure d4 pawn on d4 pawn on c3 mm -hmm. pawn on b2. Um, a lot of right. times in the London system, black plays c5, c takes d4, white plays e takes d4. So you get the same structure. If white can yeah. stick a knight on d3, um, watching the c5 square, the e5 square. The yeah, for bishop uh, protecting the b4 square for that a you know natural b5 b4 maneuver. Um, yes. it's just yeah, in any of these like queen's gambit declined type of uh, um, positions, I think the knight on d6 or d3 is, is fantastic. Wow, well, I'm pumped. I don't know about you guys, but I just learned something from a grandmaster, so that made my day. Yeah, and he's enjoying himself here. And I know D6 is just like coasting, covering E4, C4, B5. Yeah. I mean, if the bishops ever trade, he's got Knight of 5 hitting E3 and G3 and D4. Mm -hmm. Do you think he should have maybe traded on G3 at some point to open things up a little bit more? Is that going to be a missed opportunity? 
Um, I I could say potentially yes. I, I would have maybe thrown it HG3, HG3, a G6, King G7. It seems like White can't orchestrate all his pieces shifting over to the H file because E3 is hanging and it's not necessarily checkmated one. So uh, yeah, maybe Black uses the H file or at least, as you said, is just more of a target. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I totally agree that it could potentially be that case, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not to say that uh, you know G4 is some brilliant move that uh, keeps White in the game. So I think Black's still doing well. Okay, so the immediate reaction from Black is F5, which seems to basically force H3 mm -hmm. from White. So Black's still going to be able to open things up a little bit, but the G4 pawn itself is going to be a little bit solid. So Black might need like a sack to crack this. Yeah, I think um, one thing that you may want to be careful of as, um, as Black is never to allow something like Bishop c2 or like a knight d3 to e5 if white can sink a knight on e5 and play f4 then maybe he's he's like got some survival ideas mm -hmm. um the other thing is that if once we've played f5 that's where we're committed and we have to watch out for that knight d3 exactly exactly before that wasn't too much of a concern if we had played h3 um even something like f g i don't know how we take back i guess hg black mm -hmm. can move the queen like queen f6 or queen h6 and follow with g5 and then suddenly the F pawn may be a target. It's just feels like Black's pieces are so optimally placed. Yeah. Yeah, wow, that could be a little bit tough there. Um, but he's gone at H3, which is... Uh, I, I have the feeling that he's, try, he's trying to play G5 and then like put the knight back on F4, some sort of dark square thing. Uh -huh. He's trying to play G5. Yeah, well, because... Yeah, I mean, it looks like he's going to be able to. Yeah, g5, queen h5. And, and Teresa Sahakian has to keep h4 defended, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess e3 is hanging, so he's not 100% obliged to. But Oh, he wants to play f4 himself. That's what, that's what Samuel wants. He wants to play f4 himself. Watch out, gosh. Yeah, there's not much you can do about that. Um, King g2 might be the move. So f4, I will take e takes f4. King g2, so then on f4, his knight's at least defended from the bishop, and he can play e takes f4. So then, we trade, then we trade rooks, right? On e1, yeah. queen e1, e1, and I play bishop takes h3 check at the end. Mm -hmm. King takes. King takes. Queen takes f3 check. King, King h4. h4. Onwards and upwards. And maybe we just grab the bishop, even though it's not as exciting as checkmate. Yeah, and then queen e6 check. And the problem is I have queen e8 or I'm taking the knight. Oh my goodness. And you've got g6 too in some cases or queen e8 as you say. Uh-oh. Okay, so it's not so simple. It's not so simple. I kind of thought black was ready to just come crashing through. Um, let's see. Gosh actually played king h1. Not king g2. Now was f4 possible or not? It was not played. Yeah, the, the thing is, if white can arrange what he's about to do, rook e2 followed by rook c to g1, then the move knight f4 feels great. And let's not forget uh, what I mentioned earlier. Knight f4 followed by bishop c2, knight d3, and then I'm threatening knight e5 unstoppable. If black plays knight f7, then I play f4, and then I play knight e5. So, so white's threatening to just take this over suddenly. I think so, because now knight f4 can be played, and queen g5, rook g1. And I don't think moves like king g7 are doing anything about it. No. This queen's coming back to h8, probably, or... Yeah, bishop Whoa. c2. This game was turned on its head. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, I think bishop c2 here is a great move. You could also decide to overproject, like, I don't know, rook e1 or something like mm -hmm. that, but I think bishop c2 direct is, is the best approach. I mean, the... To me, almost the biggest problem is I don't even know what to do next for black. Like, I'm basically out of ideas. Yeah, I I think the move f5 was potentially a little quick. Uh, I would have built up things a lot differently. I also would have played hg3, as you mentioned. So maybe g6, king, g7 first. Uh, you know, you don't have to rush with that move. Um, I don't understand knight g2 because I don't agree with taking this pawn on h4. You don't even want it. I don't even want it. That's the thing. Um, so yeah, I, that seems wrong. I would just uh, play the knight back to f4 and you should see too. 
I'm surprised how fast Terzahakian's playing, given that the game's kind of slipping away from him. There hasn't been a moment where he stopped and said, wait a minute, what am I doing with my position? Um, and with over 10 minutes on the clock, I don't know, it's rare for me to see a GM sort of play that kind of carelessly in a sense, right? Just And by carelessly, I don't mean like he's not looking at anything, but I mean, he's like, he doesn't seem worried. He doesn't he's seem the, like- he, He's not admitting that things have gotten carried away yet. He's trying yeah. to maintain the illusion that, you know, right. it's still fine, it's still fine. He's like, whatever, I have a night on D6. You know, Amon <laughs> said I'm good. Yeah, he's too comfy with it. Uh, Rook G1, uh, all good, but I just am a little concerned that he's focusing on trying to win that H pawn, right. whereas, uh, whereas there exists another plan. Um, whereas if he well, like, put his knight on E5 and pawn on F4, the H pawn would come to him eventually. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. I think at this point, man, I think white's position is very good with this knight f4, but yeah, I think he needs to go back to it, play bishop c2. Okay, here's the other thing. Even if you don't agree with my plan, bishop c2 looks like a good move anyway. <laughs> it's a move I would throw in. Yeah, but I, I don't think anyone would disagree with your plan. Well, he is, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if he had a chance to have you explain it to him in so many words, I don't think he would disagree with you. It looks good. But uh, this isn't the first time, actually, that Gosh and I have not agreed on... Uh, I mean, he's shown some incredible patience in the previous game. That's right. Um, so He's got a lot more patience than you do. Absolutely. I Knight G2 again. Okay, so here's the thing. If he had nine minutes and his opponent had four and a half minutes, I yeah. understand the the cute shuffling, but I feel like he's actually spending more time than his opponent here, and it's hurting yeah, yeah. him because he's lower on time. That's right. And really, the concern with him is not his position so much as is he going to be able to handle it when he gets really low on time. From what we've seen today, um, that's that's my concern. I imagine there's a lot of nervous Mumbai Movers fans watching right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as his clock, you know, comes down a little bit. But last time we were here, Teresa Hawking played Queen H5 in like one second. And now he spent like a minute on the same move. Yeah, I so he, he needs to play Queen H5. Um, that's that's clear. Uh, as these guys figure this out, I think the other game is basically decided. Um, Ooh, if, I can, if I can say that. Um, I think it's just an absolute demolition. I, I think that, uh, well, I sort of, had the uh, the opinion that um, that Morocco would uh, would be uh, extremely strong in this, this format. Uh, he's just a very 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 principled player. Uh, he has come out to a great start here. Oh yeah, he's up in exchange for nothing. Yeah, if we look at how that happened, um, he just put so much pressure on the position around move seventeen, knight e four, and f is b six. <sighs> Knight d6, followed by knight d5. He's just like dancing around, taking everything. Wow. Clips one pawn, comes back. Yeah. And the thing is, after bishop h6 on move 24, mm -hmm. black's looking at a position where let's imagine he does whatever, rook e8. Yeah. Uh, white might take on g7, might play yeah. like, I don't a4. know. Yeah. What? Well, just my, oh, my b pawn's not hanging. Yeah, don't worry. Oh, yeah. Perfect. I'm not throwing your stuff away for you. <laughs> and I, I prefer to analyze anyways. It's not my stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that that position just looks so hopeless, right? And so he almost says, okay, Rook A2, let's at least make this an uh, imbalanced game. But I don't. I don't believe this for one second. No. No, I mean, that doesn't seem to offer too much hope, really. And... Uh, you know, Mareko's also got a healthy amount of time left on the clock to, to consider everything he wants to do from here. <laughs> yeah, <I> just... <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how I know that it's not a sound uh, sacrifice. I just look at the right. time. And if you're yeah. up time and up material, uh, it can't be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, if Mareko has more than seven minutes, it means he's not worried about any of this. Yeah. E4, Rook to A2. Well, there's that's... a shocker. But that's no. just nonsense, right? <laughs> Not sure what's wrong with taking the knight. 
Rook A8 is a incredibly strange move to me. Oh man, it's almost like he wishes it were a bullet game, right? And just... <laughs> Rook A8 was played so quickly. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like he thought there was no pawn on F2. I swear. Uh huh. Like as if Rook A2 was a winning. <laughs> I guess. Right. Really even strange. if the queen weren't defending the knight, queen g6 would be enough to like win this game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. Well, okay, he's he's just, just lost here. Just lost. But is he lost and he just doesn't know it, or is he lost and he knows it? I mean, he played rook a8 like he had no idea how lost he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still keeping the facade. That's what we've learned today. The grandmasters like to keep up the facade that everything's fine. Yeah. Okay, he's got a full rook. Finally. Ah, he noticed. Yeah, exactly. Noticed. All right, so the H pawn has died. Meanwhile, knight g2, queen h5, queen takes h4. Yeah, and I think got what um, he wanted. I think the difference was it might have the king might have been on f7. I, there was something a little different last time. Maybe king was on g8, so, so it wasn't working. The last time queen h5 was played, the king was on g7. The only difference was the c1 rook was on e1. Other than that, it's the same. So there was still like queen h4, queen f3, queen h6 check. Getting now the, the issue was just queen takes h4 and e3 would be hanging if uh, the rook's right. not only one. So that's why he just uh, improved. Wow. So his little dance around the around the e-pawn. And now we also understand why Tersakian didn't think the first time and did think the second time. Right. He's He's got to play f4 here, though. Um, he won't be thrilled with that. Uh, sorry, maybe he doesn't. Maybe there's knight f4 and rook g2 or rook g1, but uh, it looks a little funky. Yeah, you'd really want to be careful about letting the black knight to f3. I'm sure he will be careful about it, but let's see. Rook g1, knight f3, rook g6, king f7. Eh, it's just not the position I want to play. For yeah, and rook g3, black has rook takes e3. Ooh. Sending the knight on f3. Yeah, he goes f4. A little bit fancy because of the mate on h2. So, okay, yeah, so he just does play f4. I so mean, my only concern for white is still the clock. Come on. The, the funny uh, thing about this position is uh, if I play rook to h3, uh, I think in a weird way that I'm, like, paralyzing the whole position because king on g1 can never go to f2 without losing the pawn, and the knight on g2 can only go to e1, but it can't move there because both rooks need to defend e3. So uh -oh. I have to do some like serious gymnastics, like rook c1, rook c3, or something weird needs to happen. It's not easy to get out of this position. Yeah, it's not. All right, he's played rook f1 in response to it. Tarasakian did jump on that rook h3 move. Yeah, black should be playing also um, the move a5, I think would be a good one. Oh, um, yeah, I agree so much. Just uh, get that pawn on a dark square, fix those light square pawns. Uh, white could yeah. consider a5. Um, but again, I still don't see how white's getting out of this. King g1, so what? I don't see the next move. The knight can't move and the king can't move. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced by this position. I think black plays a5 and white's time pressure actually might uh, put him in some trouble here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, could he move back and forth really quickly and offer a draw? If he does is it quickly. <laughs> is it still going to be safe for white at least? Yeah, I feel like if white offered a draw here, I'd be pretty close to taking. But I, I would also base that on his moves. So, um, again, I don't see how he's getting out of this. Knight can't move. King can't move. If black there plays a5, maybe a white rook could come to c5. Maybe that's... Uh, rook c2? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, but I think black just plays bishop d7, b6. Uh, okay. Remember that that king could walk all the way to the other side of the board if it wants. Black right. pieces are free. That's the thing. They can do whatever they want. White's pieces are a little tied up. Yeah. And honestly, it's just the black two rooks that are tying up all the white pieces. Did, did so that means the black that? bishop and knight are free. Did you see he offered a draw? Ah, uh, yeah. And, and, and black declined. Yeah. Because you can't move. That's the problem. You can't move as white. Your pawn extra means nothing. And uh, you're down five, well, six minutes almost. That's very substantial. Yeah. All right. 
So it's time to start thinking about plans for Black, right? If he's the one declining draws, then he's the one with something to prove. Um, Gosh should just be moving super fast marking time here. Yep. And not changing too much. Yeah, because I can even see a position where Black plays rook h8 and 84 and like takes takes with the f-pawn and somehow get that bishop involved. I think the king could also relocate to the queen side, and there he goes. Got to be careful yeah. playing king e7. Might let white play knight e1. I'm not sure if he can. but So maybe play rook e7 and run under the rook on e8. Oh, you see what he did. He finally did it. Rook d3. Okay. Now the knight can move. He's untangled it. Now bishop to um, c8 mm -hmm. is perhaps an important move, which never lets you sit with the rooks on those squares and play knight e1. It's bishop c8, rook c3. Or you could let white play knight e1 and then play bishop c8, and he'll have like killed himself, no? <laughs> yep. Yep. It all comes down to uh, how the move rook c3 is handled. But yeah, I, I think that would be very good compensation for black. Knight e4. One. The thing is, white's extra pawn, where is it? It's on h2. It's so irrelevant to the position. I mean, black's about to play, yeah, bishop c8, and now he doesn't even have uh, rook Ooh. d1, so he's just hooped himself. I think it's a very easy position to lose. This um, rook on d3 is trapped. It's literally yeah. trapped. Yeah, it's really bad. Oh, you might man. have to play b4 here. Maybe it's the only move, but it's pretty bad. All right, so there's some kind of an exchange set coming. Yeah. So takes, takes, and there's hmm, maybe just bishop b7 at that point, or rook e6. I think rook e6 might be the best. Yeah. Takes, takes, rook e6. Well, this is pretty much a must-win game for Ter Sahakian, and it uh, looks like he's probably winning it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. But I have to point out that this queen takes h4, like the winning the pawn earlier. Yeah. Um, nice. After black played knight f7, it was sort of forced into, oh, this is nice. Is he just going for a mate here? Yeah, except that the, oh, his bishop's covering rook c8, so he does have it. Yeah. He's going to take king e7. Oh, so this was a very, very easy way to win it. Nice job. Accurate. He's got a trade. Um, yeah, I was going to say this queen takes h4 that white did resulted in having to play f4 and having to have this position. So I'm not sure that I was correct after all. Well, I mean, you always told him not to take the pawn on h4. Yeah, that, <laughs> and we've disagreed before, but uh, yeah. this one I felt very strongly about that somehow it just felt wrong. And black played a pretty, pretty nice game after that, actually. Yeah. All right. It's the B pawn now. Well, oh, knight G3. Is knight G3 is worth a look as well. Worth a look, yeah. Knight G3, king F2. Because <laughs> actually, why don't... Hmm. Yeah, I guess rook B3, he wants to play knight E5, bishop B5 somehow. Whole thing. I think the other thing he's looking at is... Also, king f7 to just go defend his g6 pawn. And then, because like the b pawn didn't seem to be going anywhere at this point. Yeah, I think king f7 or king f8 would be serious moves to consider here. Um, the other thing, though, is white will play b4 after you do that. And he's going to try to say takes, takes, and then d5 is hanging. And if you don't take, I mean, take on a5 and play knight c5 and hold the whole position. Yeah. That would be a draw, by the way, if the knight sat on c5. That would just be a draw. Okay. So the other way I've seen GMs play positions like this is like rook b3, knight e5, b5. Just 100%. sort of like emphasizing the past rook pawn against the knight. Yeah, I think rook a3 is not correct. No, not correct, huh? No. Uh, still great. Like, <laughs> I mean, king on g7 covers everything. I just think that uh, I agree with your, your b5 more direct. Hmm. Yeah, well, he's doing something else, and I think he's showing a little shakiness finishing this off. Yeah, because uh, knight b6, knight takes d5, and yeah, you have to think a bit too much. So he's going to go here, and he's going to go b5, I think. Well, now white can also come back with knight f6, knight d5, but instead chooses to get his king over to this side of the board. Maybe he's thinking that now on b5, a, b5, a4, king c2 is sort of going to... Yeah, king c2, just rook takes b5. Oh, sorry, b6 first, right? And then to play king c2 and sort of have that rook 
have to yeah, choose between I, the I think I think I always though I I just stay rook b5 no matter what you do. Yeah, 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 it's not good enough. Okay. So b5 still looks pretty good then. Yeah, I'm surprised he's uh taking time at this at this moment. Uh b5 looks great. I'm really feeling a lack of confidence um from him in this end game. I mean, he may or may not win it in the end anyway. But uh mm -hmm. That's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling like not confidence from black. Yeah. And now, now if a4, there was king c3. There so. would have been the king c3 trick. So now he's actually controlling the the square a4, and it's not, it's not immediately obvious to me how black wins this. Yeah, I would start with probably rook, um, like rook b1. Okay, king g6 is a good, good start as well. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, let's say rook b4. Yeah, the rook b4 is basically, is it ever threatening a4? Because there's always king c3. Maybe then rook c4 check and a3 would be good, so. Right. Uh, knight d7, I think, is completely misguided. Just a4 What's, now. Uh, I think knight d7 is knight? atrocious move. Just a3? Oh, my lord. I am with you okay. on that. A2 is just game over. King B2, Rook B3. So yeah. Okay. Knight D7 was horrible. Um, I, he almost had a, a little hold there. I thought. Yeah, yeah it's a good try. That was shocking. I mean, it's not that like I couldn't see Teresa Hawking eventually winning that endgame somehow, but Knight D7 um, was just like, never mind. Let's not play this endgame. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's really too bad because I was a big fan of uh, the the way that. Diptayan handled uh, the seemingly great position that Black had. Um, he had this weird sort of knight h3, g5, but it really turned out well for him. And then yeah. maybe got a little preoccupied with that pawn. It's hard to blame him. A pawn is a pawn, but the resulting position and the time he spent getting it was not ideal. Yeah, super, super fascinating game, actually, with several phases. But knight d7 removed a lot of the fun for me. Yeah, because that that end game. I mean, I'm not. I want to say, of course, Black's winning, but it'll it would definitely be impressive to see the technique required. You think that Black's plan right before Knight D7 was to actually bring his King to F3 and then deal with the G pawn with Rook B8 when he needs to? That's definitely a definitely a serious serious option, and I would preface that probably by playing Rook to B8 um, because I don't think that my Rook needs to be like anywhere else in particular. So probably right. leave it on B8 start to bring the king and yeah sort of depends where where white puts his pieces then maybe that's why what he had in mind with knight d7 not that it's good but like it's covering b8 so if king to g4 then i think g6 immediately and like black's just you know blown it um right but i mean that said i mean you play knight d7, stopping king g4. So he's not going to play king g4. He's going to play a4. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's too bad. I think that black should probably play rook b8, rook e8 to hit the e-pawn. Mm -hmm. And then if white plays king d3, then your rook is on e8 covering the g-pawn. So you just waltz in king f3. And if white ever lets you play a4, you play a4. All right. So I'm imagining white marks time on the c-file first with the king while waiting instead of knight d7. Uh -huh. Then at some point you'll play rook e8, king yeah. d2 to cover it, and then you'll bring your king to g4. That's what I was thinking. That is logical. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Could be tough to meet. Yeah, the knight's getting stretched. I mean, Deal with the A pawn to help the G pawn, maybe defend the E pawn, maybe attack D5 or F5. There are a lot of possibilities, yeah. but it's the knight's struggling to do them all. The other thing is that a knight and a pawn never queen against the rook, unless the rook starts off extremely misplaced or you, you lose a bunch of tempi. But as long as I like have to jump and my rook's sitting on E8, there's no way to coordinate a knight and a pawn to somehow like, yeah, like, <laughs> win, win against the rook. All right, the championship match has started. Mareko has white again versus Teresa Hakian, the Armenian Eagles official account. Two bishops c4, the bishops game. <laughs> He's uh, 
uh, clearly not a fan of the Petrov, and it's almost like he knows the guy is uh, going to play it or something. <laughs> Usually that's the only reason people play Bishop at uh, C4. Yeah, but I think in general, like trends in top-level chess, the success of the Berlin defense, you know, almost 20 years ago now, but it's set into motion yep. a series of adjustments and openings where a lot of the sort of like considered bad or second rate E4 openings for white had to be looked at again. Yep. Because Definitely. people are just looking for something to do. Yep. And there's nothing um, different about this opening. In fact, we've pretty much transposed to a, uh, uh, an Italian game, right? Yeah. Yep. And the Italian game, sort of like the Gioco Pianissimos with D3 and C3 in particular, have been played a ton in the last uh, five years at the top level. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think this may end up looking the same uh, with like, okay, H6, Rook E8, Knight F8, Knight G6. But Knight F8, Knight G6, it's actually the more unusual way to reach G6. Usually it's like Knight C6, Knight E7, Knight G6. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure if this Knight D7 move offers any other like benefits or at least other things to consider because otherwise maybe we get similar position as he does start with h6 right i guess what the question is what happens if he just leaves the knight on d7 instead of going to f8 yeah um, it, it hardly seems <clears throat> possible but otherwise i haven't seen knight d7 so much so i'm trying to understand there could be some positions where white's played d4 where the knight on c6 wouldn't be able to move to e7 Mm -hmm. um, but maybe the knight on d7 could move to f8 because the rook's still covering e5, but obviously we're not getting that kind of a variation here. White's not playing any right. of the moves to play d4. He's gone for it's knight f8. It makes sense. Hmm. Well, this is the uh, final of the knockout that I predicted. Um, I predicted Mareko versus Teresa Hakian, and I picked uh, Teresa Hakian to come out ahead despite having the disadvantage of the black pieces. If this game is a draw, then uh, then Teresakian would have white in the bullet game, but Mareko would have draw odds. Right. And it's is it a one plus one game? It would be a one plus one game. Right. Yeah. You know, basically, I mean, if people wonder why one second is being used in chess.com blitz stuff, it's for the viewers. Like a lot of this stuff, if you wonder about it, you're like, oh, this isn't how like, you know, people used to play. A lot of it is for the viewers. Like when we played one minute bullet and some of our first, um, you know, big online spectator events, the fans couldn't really follow what was going on in a one minute with zero second game. Yeah. So even when I'm playing a one minute game, I don't even know what's going on. You don't know where your own pieces are. <laughs> It's even harder to watch. Yeah. Um, all right. So the other uh, guys are playing, right? They're just playing yes. for one Yes, the third point. place match is being played at the same time. So over here, Mumbai Movers against Moscow Wizards. Right. Um, I'm going to focus... Yeah, well, no, I guess we can more at stake back and forth more. a little bit, but... There's a lot at stake for the Armenia Eagles because they started last week with one point out of six. Yeah. So the the movers this week, you know, with five points out of six, were were in that position where if they won their their match against Moscow, they would basically be going to the Summer Series Championships. You know, the the Armenia Eagles are in a position this week where if they don't score at least three points, um, you know, their their series maybe sort of decided. So they needed either Teresa Hockey to win this knockout or they need to win their club match, which is coming up in whatever, half an hour or so. Yeah. Well, the other the other thing is, um, uh, it's a little weird to me, but uh, Diptayan has not gone for the same uh, variation, even though his position looked nearly winning out of the opening in that... Uh, in that game so he changed it a little bit and he played like c takes d5 instead of a lot oh, right game. this is a rematch where in the last game he castled and after dc4 he really seemed to know the opening better yeah than so Sevchenko. Like 
that's what it looked like. And uh, Savchenko actually somehow today has, I don't think he's had a good position out of the opening at all um, in, nope. in, in any game. So uh, that's almost a scarier opponent to play because it means the guy is scoring wins for bad positions. Imagine he gets a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. That's uh, That could be pretty worrisome. Uh, Mumbai fans will be watching Deep Dion's clock during this one. Yeah, he, he really let it get the better of him last time. Here, Black has very clear plans of like trying to play Bishop F3 and Knight D4. Um, yeah. Pawn on C6 dominates that Knight on C3. Knight C4 is always in the air. Uh, Rook on B8 coming. Uh, I think that the um, Savchenko, as we were just kind of talking about his openings uh, here, he seems to be the happiest maybe of any position he's had. I 100% agree. I was going to say, I don't know if his position's necessarily good here but it's definitely the best one he's had yeah today um compared to the others it's like his pieces are developed and there's a clear plan it's yeah exactly that's very valuable but pretty good yeah pretty so much checks all the boxes for me when i play black <laughs> yeah that's good enough right there um and he's he's currently got a decent little time advantage so he yeah will be he will be comfortable there. Um, but yeah, no, uh, maybe we should uh, focus on the, the game with a lot more at stake. But uh, yeah, just checking in on that. Yep. All right. So A takes B4, C takes B4. Uh, developing the Rook on A8 for Tersahakian. And Bishop E6. If, if I were black, I'd be looking for some chance to maybe play like D4 and see some space advantage and then play on the queen side. Yep. Yeah, if um, if I can play d4 now, I would be interested because uh, I'm not so sure about knight c4. I'd be pretty, pretty interested maybe in taking that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I may want to consider is, okay, if I play d4 now, knight e, c4, um, b5, takes, takes, or not takes, maybe just knight a5. Yeah, um, just knight a5. Puts uh, puts the question to black's position. Um, right. Knight on d2 can go to b3 to c5. It should b3 to trade maybe first. Yeah. You're right. Like, suddenly my knights are not that well-placed for queenside play. So maybe my whole idea of d4 is kind of like, kind of a weird idea, right? Like doesn't really match with what's happened so far right and actually it's not so much that it's a strange uh idea but it, if you do it in that move order it may appear that way uh, which yeah. is why he actually played b5 so he likes the idea but he wants to stop knight c4 and try to play d4 immediately yeah and um, mareko has got his eyes on c5 and a5 anyway as outposts for the knight i mean whether or not black plays d4 his knight's going to be happy on those squares yeah, I think Black is happy though. I have to be honest. After after D four, I'm interested in some like just taking away like maybe knight is knight D seven possible? Maybe knight D six. He's he's got a retort there. Um, Bishop takes F five. Also seems like he's surviving because again, I'd like to play like takes knight E seven, bring knight to D five to C three. But uh, I am losing some pawns on the way there. Right, rookie five, and then if we go knight d5, maybe even knight d4. Well, knight c3 will have to be stopped. But yeah, don't want to really sack the e5 pawn. Just my instinct is I don't want to. Right. I was also thinking of knight d5 here. Um, That's a cool move. Right, and then if knight takes g7, I play knight c3. And I think, yeah. I think yeah. I'm okay there, right? Um, it, it looks like I almost have to take you, but uh, Bishop takes f5 looks uh, looks nice there. Right, this d5 pawn doesn't uh, seem linked to anything else in White's position. Sorry, hang on. Knight yeah. g7, knight c3, knight takes c6. Yeah. How does that go? Well, I just recapture it. On like, e6? Like with, my, like with my rook or something, yeah. Right, and I was curious how how that was after like I don't know Queen Queen H five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was thinking I would take the rook and play Queen G five or something. Because mm -hmm. right. otherwise, I mean, your move looks really good, Knight Knight D five. Like if yeah, if, if, if this isn't anything for me, like, yeah, it looks like really weak compensation. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I like that 
I also think that there is something to be said for bishop takes f5, e takes, knight mm -hmm. e7, that pawn sack with the knight coming into c3. Oh, yeah. You could uh, consider it. Yeah, but both of those look very good. I think black's doing well. Very okay, well. He, he went for a third route. He played knight to d7. That was also something you said you might want to play. Yeah, I, I you had, were wondering uh, about six. I and, think I just uh, shunned it a little early because yeah. knight b6, rook f8, knight b5, queen b6 just traps the knight. <laughs> ah, all right. So we were worried about the b pawn, but it's covered. So he does play knight d7. Sorry, yeah. he does play knight d7. White plays queen f3, rook to a2. I've been wanting that move. Yeah, <laughs> Let me I agree. Tell you. I've been wanting my rook on a2. Okay, and now queen to b6, knight a5. Well, both sides have their advantages here. It, it looks messy. Yeah, I think that white's position has improved a lot more than black's has in the last couple moves. Um, I, Frank, I think both knight d5. Anything for white against knight d5. Like, yeah. nothing good for white there. Yeah. No, I think uh, you're knight d5 and maybe even bishop f5 and a7 seem both better candidates than what we see here. Knight on a5 is really solid, and... Yeah. Bishop, there's bishop b3 in the air. Um, there's bishop right. b1 in the air. Yeah, bishop b3. It, it seems really worst really place good. piece, right? He dealt with his worst place piece, which was the c2 bishop. Yep. Black's going to put pressure on this b pawn, though. Um, yeah, he wants to play knight takes, I think knight takes b3 here, and then on knight c6, just knight c5. Mm -hmm. That should work. So knight b3, knight c6, knight c5? Yeah. Yeah. That looks fine. I, he could also take with his rook if he wants to keep the knight on b8 by taking away c6. True. I uh, And then if knight a6, there's always these rook c6 moves. I'm not sure what to think of them. But I was worried more that, like, I feel after rook b3 that um, something like knight a6, knight takes b4 uh -huh. put, puts me, like, really offside. But... Knight yeah. a6 runs into either rook or knight to c6, so maybe maybe he's in time there. All right, so yeah, the rook on b3 is going to take a lot of time to fix, but his idea is keep that knight on b8. Yeah. I will have time to eventually play some version of rook c5 or rook c7, rook b3 to b1 to c1. Yeah. And, I mean, if this rook on b1 makes it to the c file, it's game over. I that, agree, that, yeah. Like, rook c7 next and if ever knight a6 is always rook c6 yeah. um, i have to say the move queen e6 doesn't impress me yeah um, not sure where that was going huh it looks like it's making white do a move that he almost had to do anyway rook b1 um yeah. plus knight a6 is never possible because of rook um rook c6 all right is he sure he can allow this oh man i guess so I just like with a queen on c8, I'm seeing like, you know, queen g4, h4, h5. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think h4, h5 is a very good start. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is black may want to sink that rook on c3. Right. Or c2, potentially. And the other possible problem for black is it, for white is if we trade on c8 and then play h4, then black might play queen c2. On, right. And basically get out of the worst of the problems after... Well, maybe there's rook e1 or something there, but if rook f1, then, you know, queen e2 or something. And basically, white's white's attack has been cut off from behind. Uh-huh. So maybe we don't even want to trade on c8 and give the c file. So rook, let's say rook c8, queen c8, h4, queen c2, rook f1. Um, if queen e2, maybe I take and then bring my rook to c1. And having the c file may prove quite valuable uh yeah just go back to winning the the original plan right which was just go to the c file right hey you said if that rook on b1 makes it to the c file and that's technically that rook that is technically <laughs> that rook <laughs> and that is technically winning too i mean <laughs> yeah, let, look, yeah that looks good h4 h5 by the way is really going to be annoying um i think it was more that the move rook c3 maybe was what he didn't want to see i'm not sure yeah, but if he traded rooks, he was preventing rook c3, right? If he trades rooks and plays h4, then what was what was black going to do about that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think h4 needed to be played, and okay. rook c8 seems like the best way to achieve that, so yeah. that, that would have been my preference. Okay, see. So your rook c3 move did get played, right? Even with queen d1 sort of coming back towards that side of the board. Right. Um, you know, Black figured, like, hey, maybe I'll lose the C3 pawn, but 
I'm doing some stuff in the meanwhile, right? I mean, does he have rook d2 to d3 or? Uh, yes, first of all, but uh, other other than that, six? isn't it really uh, annoying to defend that pawn here? Otherwise, I don't see a way. Knight c6, it has to be more indirect stuff, I think. Right. But there are there are there are things. I mean, I think it's like a good resource for Black to try Rook C three mm -hmm. in a position that was otherwise going to be really bad. Yeah, King on H seven is super safe, by the way, for Black. Like nothing to worry about really. The Knight on G six is terrible, <laughs> but the Knight on A five maybe is also kind of out of play. Yeah, Rook D two. And if Queen F three, then C two. Very strong. Yeah. Also, if Queen F three, like, why on earth did we play Queen Queen to D one like two moves ago while Black? Yeah, I agree. Got to play Rook C three just like Amon wanted. Okay. So what about Queen B three? Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you take and take, I play Nate C five, and then I think I'm very happy. Well, Knight C five, Rook to D four. Oh, you want to want to get funky? I don't want you to be happy. Is basically <laughs> that's, what I that's what I good. don't want. Yeah, that's I right. don't want to just like run away. Have you played Rook C three and sit there laughing about how you're going to win any way you want later? <laughs> I was planning to laugh that way. Yeah. Ah, my, boards, my boards keep switching around. Who's got white and black? I'm sorry, people. I don't know why it keeps doing that. E2. The, the thing is, I, I don't know. I mean, queen b3 looks like the best type of resource. Maybe after queen b3, he wants rook. Does rook takes d3, rook takes c3, anything? No. Hmm, I'm impressed both players still seven, have seven and a half minutes, this one. Queen f1. Hmm. Queen f1. So c2, queen e1. Just the idea. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I'm I'm really drawn in positions like this to like knight f four, and like let's say pawn takes like queen g six, like just some sort of random nonsense, and trying to play mm -hmm. c two and rook d one in in on a good day. Yeah, what I was drawn to was queen a two with the idea of like rook c three, rook f two. And then queen a1 check, but white would right. have rook c8 to spoil that. An in betweener, yeah. Yeah. So knight a6 is played, trading the c pawn for the b pawn. I think that's, unless there's a tactical problem that, which maybe there is, I don't know where that knight's going, but that could be a very reasonable way for black to uh, Sorry, but queen b6 here? Might okay. Be, might be an issue. Might be the answer, right? So queen b6, queen e1 is almost the only move. Mm -hmm. uh, that knight on a5, by the way, is still fairly trapped. Um, I can play rook takes d3 in that position. Uh-huh. You could. And then white tries rook c8 check, king h7, queen takes b4. Mm. Right back at me, actually. Same thing that I, yeah, that happened to me. And then rook d1 check. King G2 and any type of knight G6, queen G6. There's always knight G3. Let's say in the worst case. So right, you're... yeah, you got to play knight F4. <laughs> you got <laughs> not, not its desired F4. effect. Not desired effect. And then queen F8 is a good thing for people to know about too. So I'll just show that. Mm -hmm. Throw that in there. That that's how. When you've got a knight stuck on A5, you need a way to sort of turn the tide of things quickly. You can't just wait to consolidate too long. Okay, well, he's thinking queen b1. Yeah, it's just such a weird move. Like queen b6 looks so natural. Uh, queen e1 will be played. And I'm almost just like offended that black isn't, doesn't have a move. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what about just rook um, c2? Mm-hmm. Okay, he just played queen e1. So now rook c2, sure. 
Rook a2, also playable. Now the knight, I think, has to come to b3. At least that's what I had been. Well, there's that there's that rook c8 move. Do you want to throw it in? Probably not, huh? I don't think it's worth throwing in here because uh, no, because it's allowing knight d3 then. Yeah, I agree. after after we save our our knight, there will be knight d3 from black, which is everything black wants to do. So yeah, knight has to. And right. where's my <laughs> where's my move? Where's my thing? I want something. Knight c2. So can it be something like positional, like knight c6 and b4, and then the game just keeps going? Yeah, <laughs> king h7. There it is. King h7. You said he'd be safe there. It's a good move. I really like it, actually. Yeah. I, li I like that move a lot. Long, 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 long ago, when I was learning chess out of chess books, I read a comment about how brilliantly Kasparov prepared his attacks, and they said he always moves his king to h2. Right. Before he makes his sacrifice. Yes. That's that's how that's a great great advice for people like wondering like how do I make the most accurate move? That's uh that's a great way to start. Like ninety nine percent of the time, that's correct. So it's a it's a good good way to start. All right. So um Mareko's had a chance though to shut off some of the pressure against F two and D three. So I think we are now headed for a slightly longer game instead of you know, the tactical resolution that seemed possible. Um and that said, positionally, I'm happy with black with what black with the transition blacks made with rook c3 and the pawn structure change. How about you? Is like is black's position like sound to you? Um, black's position is sound mostly because here the queen has to go to a square it doesn't want because rook a1 is about to win the game. So, um, hmm. like what she would want would be queen to b1 to <laughs> win the black sure. pieces. Exactly. <laughs> rook a1. All right. The queen d2 or queen e2 map seem like they have to be played. Mm -hmm. That's not good. That is not good. So queen d2. Mm -hmm. uh, rook a1, king g2, knight e1. Jeez. We're, we're getting warm. We're, we're it's getting pretty, warm. It's pretty active. All right, he's played rook a1. Uh, oh, you still want to play knight f4, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, I really, really do. Um, so knight e1, king has to go to h3, no question. And now, how is knight f4 and queen g6? Just burn it out there. All right. Not even, not even sure if there's a threat. Actually, queen g2 and knight f3 queen is my threat. Queen g2 is a good threat. So in the past, we tried to defend this for black with knight to g3. So let's try that first. So knight f4 takes queen g6, knight g3. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then uh, I suppose, uh, let's say, h5. I just want to play queen g4. Nice, nice. Terra Sahakian burning a little bit of time here, by the way, folks, falling a little bit behind on the clock. But if he can find, you know, yeah, a knockout sequence it. like this, then this is exactly... That's where you use your time, time kids. <laughs> um, H5, that looks pretty vicious. What are the options now? Queen E2? I mean, I can't I can't allow Queen G4 made in one. I have to play something that stops that. Yeah, no, Queen, queen E2, though, is, is a nice move. Um, that looks very good. Um, then Black can taking on f4 with the pawn but white plays queen h5 check Ugh. yes and let's not forget that in every single one of these calculations h or sorry b4 can be played which he just did which he just did you know it's and just then, like one of those moves because now knight f6 now. now his queen has wandered to the other side to because he didn't want to play like rook b3 queen takes yeah. c5 right he was like no i'm knight not f4. having that knight f4 buddy you know it works now you know. Does it work? Are you sure it does? Let's see. Pawn takes, queen g6. Well, if the queen defends, then pawn takes rook at the end always. Huh? Yeah. Ooh. Conditions okay. are perfect. Come on. So let's, perfect. Let's, let's finish it off. Knight f4 takes queen g6. Must yeah. still be your move, right? Knight g3, I think it's the only, the only attempt, right? Because uh, I do have an a1 rook hanging. Right. I mean, we have to be sure that queen g2 is mate, but it is mate. So we're just going to assure the fans who might be wondering that black does have the checkmate at the end of that. So 
Then if I play h5, uh, I'm threatening mate again, and this time your queen e2 fails to taking your rook. That's the big difference. That's why I, I, I sort of jumped on this as like, ah, it's, it's working out. Right. Queen e2, pawn there's, takes rook. There's no other and... way to defend that except f3. I think f3 must be the, uh, the consideration. All right, so h5 f3 very good if knight takes f3 then the king even has like an escape route on g2 so mm -hmm. that position looks uh looks critical yeah uh, he's just played the move rook d1 so he oh he still has everything he has all that stuff it's there but uh i know but we couldn't make it work in time and neither could he uh he's invested quite a bit of time trying to make it work has teresa hakian and now this queen wants to get into f7. Uh-oh. And it's hitting the uh, rook on d1, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if I can't take the rook on c3. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking of that. Takes on uh, c3, and then... The knight comes back to b3 after queen takes queen, c2. But then I'm going to play queen somewhere. I'm going to hit your f7 pawn, right? Oh, you're not going to play knight b3 for white to stop queening? I was thinking hypothetically, queen yeah. b3, queen uh, takes on f7, and you can't stop checkmate, so you have to be going for knight f4 stuff, and I'm not sure that works. That's what scared me. So when I take the rook on c3, you don't take my queen? I take your queen, and you then you play c2, and then yeah. I go like queen b3 or queen b7 or something. Oh my but, gosh, you just let it go, and you go yeah, queen. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. Wow. Yeah. I saved uh, king on h7. What has happened? Wait a minute. Queen f7, rook a7, knight d7. What's going okay. on here? Let's see what happened. Rook a1 got played. That looks like a, I want to say, bad move. Queen takes f7. Uh, yeah, rook a7 forced. And then knight d7. I think you just totally missed this. Yeah, this is just bad. Oof. He doesn't have rook a7 there even? Yeah, this is he missed that. I think he but totally wasn't missed Queen it. B, wasn't Rook A one played in order to have Rook A seven? Yeah, but then Knight D seven, and it's just Knight D seven just over. Starting checkmate, covering Queen F six. Uh oh. Things trade, and but Black is down a pawn, and it's it. <laughs> but the the Knight on G six now is the worst piece on the board. It's so bad. It's so, so bad. bad. Knight on E one also looks like. Completely nonsense. So, uh, yeah, this is just lost now. Poor uh, guy. Well, he's, really got to, like he's got to struggle on a little bit, but he also spent four or five minutes looking for a knockout. And then when yeah. you don't find it, then you really pay for it. Absolutely. But it made sense to look for it. It it really looked like it was so close to having it. I think Rook B2 here is game over. Um, Rook C1, Knight B3 wins, and otherwise FB4 falls. Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with spending the time, but I'm just surprised that he spent the time and didn't play it almost anyway, because even if it didn't, even if you couldn't find a complete win, it looked really, really close. Like, you, you felt like it's just somebody should have been there. Uh-huh. I've lost games like this before, too, where it's, it's, it's almost like the position beats you because the position says your position is pretty good. You should look for the thing. You invest all the time. It's not quite that good. Yeah. And then, then you just don't have the time to play like the normal position that you have. No, I, I agree. It's the worst type of collapse. Uh, all right. Um, well, so he I, resigns. Uh, position yeah. just lost. Somebody down too many pawns. The other game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, still going. The other game, it's actually uh, Sevchenko's down to just seconds, and he's down a pawn. So I have to say he's the favorite to lose here. Yeah. Although, does Knight B2 save him? Uh, sort of. After bishop b3, I think the knight is actually in a very, very weird spot. Ah, uh, yes, yes. White has this rook check to keep his pawn. Well, you got to win that a pawn or or you'll this lose rook. once the knight's committed to b2. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rook f3 might be a good move to throw in. Force f5. Rook e2 to a2 if the knight takes. Is that tactic hold? Is that uh, tactic hold? Uh, knight d3 would probably be played. So the knight would just have to come back. And I guess it would get to c5 or e5, and the game would stay, would keep mm -hmm. going. I like the idea that the knight is trapped there. I'm just not sure if I can maintain it. I can't guard d3 and protect my a pawn. <laughs> That's the annoying thing. 
Okay. That was three points five. scored for the uh, three points scored for the capybaras just now by Mareko, and uh, two points for uh, for Armenia from uh, from uh, Teresa Hakian. Those are the two teams that entered the week at the bottom of the standings because they lost their team matches last week. So that means the standings are going to be a little bit closer after this week than they were before this week. They're going to bunch up a little. Mm -hmm. And those two teams are actually um, playing each other uh, playing next. Each other. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of points, actually. Like one of those two teams is going to walk away with the maximum points on the week, right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, if Sao Paulo wins, they'll get six points for the week. If Armenia wins, they'll get five points for the week. So, yeah, I think we're not going to get a completely clear picture about which team is is in or out from this week. Oh, nice switcheroo. Nice switcheroo. I approve. Agreed. I approve. Look over at that king side. Pop in there. The bait get switch. something. Uh, looking at like rook c6, knight a4, rook e6, check here. Uh, to bring the white rook to e5. I imagine there's some other options as well. Yeah. Oh, two yep. minutes to consider all those options while the opponent has six seconds. How luxurious. I know. Even rook e6, king d7, rook a6, just pinning that knight looks uh, like it might just win the knight on the spot. Uh, oh, if we could just pin him. Because if rook d3 is bishop c6 and rook that's, can't that's, go to a2. That's, that's evil of you. I'm going to show everybody how evil you are. Rook <laughs> check, king here, rook here, tying him up. And if you try and get out with this normal rook d3 trick, then there's bishop to c6. Very yeah. You'll notice um, one of the themes is kind of like always looking for these ways to actually pin the knight to the rook and use that against black. So black didn't even take the pawn on a4. He just kept his knight closer to the king side. Yeah. And he's, he's in so... He recognizes the danger of this white rook eating up all his pawns on the king side. So he's saying, for now, the rook has to just keep the a pawn from queening, and he needs to keep fighting on the king side. Yep. Um, and... On rook e3, he wants f4. Yeah, and he's stopping rook e5, which is more effective than rook f6, because rook e5, you know, if your f pawn runs, then your g pawn dies. So on rook f6, black can just play f4 and not lose too much just yet. I mean... Right. I think the question is to evaluate uh, knight e1 as a move, because otherwise rook g6 looks like a looks like a really good start. You can't take the a4 pawn because of bishop check. Uh, bishop... Mm -hmm. Six to f takes f five as a threat, and rook takes g five as a threat. Oh, um, nice, nice. So it's really tough to do anything there. Nice. Rook takes h five. All right. Well, I credit Sevchenko with uh, pulling that off with five seconds to not just like flag and lose all three pawns. Yes. Um. I think he found probably his best practical chance given the situation, but also, I mean, gosh, got as much as he needed to to win the game. So, <laughs> yeah. So that worked out for him too. Rook f8 doesn't quite work. So here, probably bishop c2, rook b2, rook c8, and then everybody's mm -hmm. happy. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can take that. Let's take it. Then get the king out of there. Probably give a check. Run the h pawn as far as you can. Rook c6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with five That's seconds on three pawns, that shouldn't be a, an issue here. Keep yeah. going. Just keep going with that h pawn. Yeah, why not? You're a wizard, Ari. And don't keep pushing it. That's one not mistake. Now. <laughs> uh, now just because takes rook c6, and then you might end up in a drawn end game or something silly. Yeah, the bishop's hanging too. But maybe if we move the bishop, mm -hmm. we could introduce this idea of playing h6. Maybe bishop to a4 here. Looks odd, but. Mm -hmm. Might be strong. Yeah, he wins on time, but I think it's 
not uh, it's not like he was not going to win on the board as well <laughs> no he was uh winning both ways so that was well done so um a bunch of points scored by white this week last week um zero games won by white in these knockouts in these 15 uh in these 15 minute games and uh this week we saw three games won by by white right it seemed like uh i mean it, the moscow wizards showed up in droves today right and they they took the match against mumbai um, but it seemed like eventually Sapchenko's sort of lackluster opening positions he was getting sort of caught up to him, and uh, he wasn't able to win any uh, games in this knockout format. So they still claimed three points, which is better than the one point from Bumai, but but yeah. uh, but still, it's um, uh, I mean not not a big week for for the uh, the movers there. Yeah, well, Dip Tyon came through when the points really mattered here in the knockout. Yeah. Um, and one thing I noticed was he had a little bit more time on his clock as he went into this final phase. He spent like two to three minutes playing this end game pretty well and yeah. uh, putting the nails in. He managed it much better. Off in there. Um, so uh, that scores three points for Sao Paulo, two for Armenia, and one for the Wizards. Uh, we will be back after a short break with the, um, with the match, uh, the fan club match between uh these two teams the uh capybaras and the eagles if yeah. you want to join that you still can there's uh 10 minutes 15 minutes to get in there join one of those teams and uh yeah we'll see you in a couple minutes
Welcome back, everybody, especially fans of the Armenia Eagles and the Sao Paulo Capybaras, who will be doing battle in 13, 14 minutes here. Good luck to all of you. Yeah. This should be an uh, exciting one, uh, David. We just saw both of these uh, top players go head to head in the finals of the knockout. So clearly yeah. some of some super strong teams and um, we'll, we'll have to see how this, uh, this match plays out. Yeah. I think um, as a, as a fan of super high quality chess, it'll be fun to see um, a rematch between Mareko and uh, Teresa Hakian. They'll play mm -hmm. two games against each other this time. So that'll be, that'll be cool. I feel like Teresa Hakian had some chances in that game and, and, you know, made a, made a very fun and interesting game of it. So no doubt it should be, it should be close. Um, so now let's talk about um, our predictions for where the summer series is headed when we get to the summer series championships. Uh, my bracket's already slightly messed up based on the seedings because I expected the Moscow Wizards to finish second in uh, this group C. And after seeing their performance so far, I think... They're edging towards probably first place in the division if they can keep up these, you know, hundred player fan club matches. Yeah. Um, Very impressive. Should be enough to carry them um through uh at the moment. Um, and they do they have taken over the lead in the division right now temporarily with um seven points. Yep. Right now, just barely close division. Um, but anyway, so my, my seedings are maybe a little bit messed up already, but I do see, um, the teams that were in the final fours this year, um, bottom, bottom snowballs, St. Louis archbishops and Chengdu pandas as again, being sort of like the top teams. Once we get into the normal sort of four on four match situation, um, I don't see, I don't see any so what, weather. At what, sorry, at what point does that kick in? Oh, in the summer series championships, basically this whole like knockout um, phase uh, in August, it'll be four on four matches. There won't be fan clubs in the playoffs, basically. Right. Okay. So yeah. uh, that's so once we get down to these top 10 teams that are playing matches against each other. <laughs> that was uh, uh, that, that might have affected my uh, bracket there, David. I de definitely didn't know that. Uh huh. So your bracket was like fan club matches, still, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I was like, oh man, we're gonna win this one so easily because uh, there's no way our fans can play worse than we did. Right. Uh, yeah. So You're I like, can say that bench our team, put our fans <laughs> in, and we're the champions. Absolutely. I was thinking that a hundred percent. Uh, well, I mean, you know, to be fair, the chess bras, you got your team hasn't played that badly either. You're right on the cusps of the playoffs this year in a race with the Sopranos. It was close. Um, but I, I, I really did think that, uh, you know, in terms of fan clubs, I thought, okay, we have a chance to have one of the biggest fan clubs. Definitely. And, and I thought, I thought we'd use that to our advantage to steamroll through, but, um, okay. So, well, there you go, guys. Those are my predictions. 100% yeah. accurate. <laughs> so Amon is uh, predicting based on uh, continued live club fan club matches, um, which I think would also be like fun to see. I mean, I think it'd be awesome to see some of the top clubs get matched against each other, right? Because basically, we're never going to see unless you know it's organized outside of the summer series, but we're never going to see the Chess Bras Club against the Sao Paulo Capybaras Club or the Moscow Club. So, um, or the gnomes is another team which hasn't played yet, but has a big, um, fan club. Yeah. Um, I, I think be facing uh, them. They, they have a, a huge fan club actually. And I mean, it's probably growing in the fact that, you know, Magnus has his own chess club now. So that's the thing in Norway, <laughs> everyone's joining clubs there. That's right. He's got his, he's got his club. He can tell everybody now that you've joined my live club, go join this online club too. You'll be in so many clubs. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, okay, well, um, it would be fun to see some of those fan clubs 
play each other. And I, I don't think it's that hard to arrange. So it could be, it could be fun to do that outside of the summer series. Right. To, uh, have like, you know, some of the top couple fan clubs play each other it would be fun to see. But yeah. given that the summer series championship playoff part will be these four on four matches, um, which teams do you think you would favor in that four on four format? Well, uh, then I think, I mean, uh, going back to some of those teams that made it to the final four is a, is a pretty obvious leap um, in terms of uh, <laughs> jumping to conclusions there. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense, uh, picking some of those teams that have made it through uh, the entire regular season all the way to the finals. I mean, that's an incredible amount of consistency. So it's, it's not, not something that you can discount and say, oh, you know, this format would be different. It's actually, once you make it to the, the playoffs, very similar format so right i think those remain uh the big favorites uh the the other thing is that uh the only thing about the chess bras is that we just can't make the playoffs but if you precede us in the playoffs maybe we uh -huh. have a chance maybe you'd have a chance <laughs> i mean the chess bras were in the playoffs a couple of years back um a squad that had lee chow and fabiano caruana um yes. i guess that was probably the first season of the pcl yeah that was the very first one at 2017 um, and they played what I think many, I mean, definitely top two or three most exciting matches ever in the, uh, in the uh, semifinals against uh, Wesley So and the Archbishops and went to like tie breaks and Tri triple overtime. Right. And yeah, then went to uh, triple tie breaks. And it was also like uh, the semis, as you said, but it felt like the finals yeah. it was such an intense one. Yeah, I mean, the Archbishops went on to win, so and you were in triple tie breaks against them. So uh, yeah. it, it, was, it was, you know, possibly the first and second best teams in the league that year playing each other there. So you guys could, you guys could acquit yourselves in the playoffs. But, um, okay, so if we, if we maybe agree that some of those final four teams from this year, like the Archbishops or the Pandas or the Snowballs might be somewhat favored in the playoffs which of the yeah. other non top four teams do you think would have the best chance to make a run so now you could well the, the one of the things i'm just unaware of though is uh like who who's even on the sao paulo team because aren't they new like i don't even know their roster they are new they are new their roster we know for sure includes firuzja ali reza <laughs> whoa <laughs> okay yeah. yeah and sandro moreco those have been their representatives last week and this week Whoa. Okay. Yeah. So, so they're kind of like uh, revealing their roster one week at a time. There's a choosing a different champion. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That's uh well, Ferruja playing on your team is already, I think that already puts you uh, to, to be a favorite. Certainly. Um, yeah. Ferruja, uh, a lot of people would say gives you the strength of like a 2,700 plus in, in some of these formats, but yeah. he's not even rated that way. So right. in terms of like uh, average rating space, he feels yeah. like very good uh, value. Um, Mareko, uh, I had him as the huge favorite. Uh, just in general, I think he's a really strong player. He demonstrated that today. Some really, really good chess in the, not the KO format. So having him on yeah. your team is uh, he's very good. He, he did really well for the, the Buenos Aires team back when he was playing there in the PCL. So uh, that already becomes a big pick. Uh, when I see Sao Paulo, I have to say that probably Krikor would be on that team uh, as is. well. He's so. uh, he's in fact streaming their matches right now. So, okay, uh, he's sort of uh, I think squad squad streaming with our with our stream here, and right. uh, managing the team and playing for the team and streaming for the team. So busy yeah, busy guy. Yeah, no that that feels like a big pick right there. Um, uh, Sao Paulo, I think uh, of the teams that aren't let's say in the top the top four mm -hmm. um, is definitely definitely one to watch out for. It sounds like. Yeah, uh, the team that I thought maybe would have a big chance that wasn't in the Final Four is the Minnesota Blizzards. I, th I mean, they don't have any 2,700. They don't even have like a 2,600 who plays like 2,700. They just got like a bunch of guys who all play over 2,500, you know, over their ratings by a bit. And even when they're up against, you know, 26, 2,700 GMs, they still score some points here and there, all of them, and come out ahead as a team eventually. Um, yeah, usually there's no I'm not such a roster like that, I think, in the, in the whole league that's so balanced. Yeah, I mean, usually I don't expect a balanced roster to be that good, but somehow I think the Blizzard are really strong, and uh, 
I would think that they would have a shot in all their matches. Um, yeah, completely agree. Because whenever you have a balanced roster, it all comes down to can your lower boy, uh, boards absolutely destroy uh, the lower boards of other teams? And can your higher boards claim points against uh, people they're probably going to be outmatched against? And uh, it's always going to be a close match because you're always going to beat the people that you're playing down against. And it's whether or not you can perform playing up. And, uh, you know, for, for most yeah. of their team, they're like IMs, 2450. And those guys can always score points, uh, full points, half points against the uh, 2600s. Yeah. And I think, um, I think they may be the one team that's ever had like a board four score four out of four or something. Um, right. so they, like, they have managed to score some points and, uh, yeah, I think, I think, um, they'll be pumped up, you know, you, you and them and the gnomes are the three teams I would see coming through from group D, um, right. three teams that are so popular that I think whichever team finishes in third will, uh, get the fan vote on August 17th and, and make it into the championship bracket as well so i think we'll get three teams from that division they'll all have just played for three weeks division d being the last week i mean right. the last division so right. i think everyone will be pumped up and all those all those three teams will be scary yep definitely agree there um let's see we've got a minute so i'm going to plug one other random thing that i like to plug and remind people of which is that we have a best fan prize for every division um so each three week season is a new or each three week, whatever mini mini season is a new is a new chance for one fan to stand above all the other fans shine brighter. Um, and uh, that fan is picked off a variety of factors, including playing in the matches, uh, you know, blogging about the matches or streaming the matches or, you know, raising interest on social media about the matches. So that's a that's a cash prize um, each each three weeks, and right now we're in week two. So um, for Division C, it's uh, it's wide open. Who's going to be the top fan? So if you guys are playing, um, consider consider uh, posting your games, analyzing your games, talking about your club. Right. Lots of prizes to be won. Um, another thing, which is kind of. Uh... Kind of interesting is uh well two things not only did uh like i think maybe almost double or even triple the participation in this match uh we see from sao paulo um so many more people have shown up for that team uh compared to armenia that it actually uh means that uh, on every single board um including the top board if you think of fide rating for the the star player for each right. team Sao Paulo is actually higher rated than every single opponent that they're playing against. So this might be the biggest like mismatch in, in like fan club uh, <laughs> history so far. That is true. That top board is going to be a narrow FIDE rating advantage because um, Teresa Hockian is actually at his all-time career high FIDE rating. And um, he played 95 rated FIDE games in the last six months, Amon. I um, haven't played like that many in the last two years. <laughs> yeah. That's oh. more than 15 per month. Um, so that's like, that's like an incredible rate of play. You, you know how exhausting that could be um, all against like, you know, other GMs and, uh, and the oh, yeah. preparation that goes into that. And uh, his FIDE ratings up to 26, 25, only 15 points below Mareko. So yeah, no, that, that'll be like incredibly spot. close match. And we've seen uh, uh, by the game they played already that it, we can tell it's going to be quite evenly matched, but at least uh, Mareko being higher rated lets me say that they're higher yeah. rated everywhere. So <laughs> that's good. It works for the certainly set. does. And it's true. And uh, they're off. So any last minute reinforcements are now are now in play. And yeah. uh, the two teams are getting down to it. These two teams lost their club matches last week uh right. and so going into this week i would have said that they were basically in a must win situation like whichever team lost this live club match i would have said was not going to make top two but i think by finishing first and second in the ko they may have scored enough points that it's not like they'll be mathematically eliminated mm -hmm. um but but it'd be pretty bad um, to yeah. lose the second uh, KO match. Yeah, 
that's that's definitely true. And we already saw them play with these same colors, and he played bishop c4, right? The bishop's opening. So <laughs> and you he said he pressed. must be avoiding the Petrov. Yeah. <laughs> clearly, he he knew what he was talking about. He must have looked up the guy's openings. Yeah. Uh, but here he decides to go for it. So I don't know if he was unhappy with the other game, uh, or if he just wanted a different position, and maybe he looked at this opening as well. Maybe in the in the knockout phase, he really like rated his chances to win with white instead mm -hmm. of going to the bullet game. So he wanted to play something a little bit more like dynamic and tense, give right. himself the most chances to win that game. And now in the team match, as you said, he's leading the Capybaras, but um, the Capybaras have the bigger have the bigger list of players for this week's match. And yeah. they just scored the first point. <laughs> like the <laughs> thing is, uh, David, on the bottom boards, it's a 700 against the 1600. Yeah. Like, it, I, I think this is going to be potentially... Uh, bigger than 50 point gap um, between them. I'm, I'm not sure how many games there are. So the, the other thing is that uh, between Mumbai and Moscow, there was just more games ongoing. So yeah. if things start to spiral out of control, they just, it spirals worse when there's more points to be claimed. Well, uh, so far, so far, Wicked Lava is, is opening a big lead on the clock, as we can see here, everybody. Um, so it's a good start. For the most <laughs> the most outrated player in this match, we'll uh, we'll be rooting for him. You got to root. You got to root for somebody who's a thousand point underdog. Yeah. No, this is uh... <laughs> he, he's playing against the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, we, uh, we've got thirty boards total for each team, uh, right. so a sixty point match. And uh, yeah, my point about the opening selection was maybe uh, maybe he's willing to play more safely here, Mareko, um, mm -hmm. and more okay with a draw um, than in the other than in the knockout format. Yeah, because of the strength and size of his his club. And we do have um, looks like one, two, three, four. I see four titled players there for for Sao Paulo. Yeah, we've got a battle between Artak Manukian and Last Gladiator. This looks like it might also be a Petrov. What what opening is this? This looks like maybe just a Queen's Gambit where White played maybe D4, D5 at some point. Three Sicilian. C3 Sicilian. Okay, where White just plays a quick D5 pawn break. Black right. declines the Queen trade on move 13. <laughs> yeah, hmm. because the the other way to decline it uh, in a much nicer way looks like bishop e6 um, on move 13. Mm -hmm. And then if queen takes d8, honestly, maybe knight takes d8. Um, yeah. And, and then if you don't trade, I bring my knight back to c6. All looks good. And if you do, I play knight takes c6 and everything looks fine. Yeah. If you've ever been a professional chess player and you see the opportunity to play this as black on move 10, like, I don't know. You... You can't get too funky. You got to be happy that, that you got yeah. a good chance at a draw, I think. Yeah, because queen c7, you're really asking for it after queen h5, rook c1, right. rook d1. Uh. Yeah, I mean, letting this white queen to get h5 to h5 is a bit of a problem. She's very strongly placed there, and once she's there, it's harder for your pieces to ever come challenge her. Maybe he knew about Manukian's endgame, Amon. I don't know if you know this because uh, because the Eagles are in a different division than the chess bras, but Manukian is like an endgame fiend. Wow, I don't know if I did. Is there a specific yeah. example, like a like a game that he won? Or he a couple of weeks ago, he won a rook endgame down two pawns, like rook and three against rook and five. He didn't have a pass pawn or anything, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's a. Uh, He's a real, he's a real like fanatic. Once he gets to the end game, he's super happy. And I've seen him win a bunch of one or two pawn down end games over the course of the summer series. Wow. Okay. That's uh, <laughs> people take note then. Yeah. I guess last gladiator took note, but man, I would have gone for that end game. Yeah. <laughs> you and against the man himself. All right. So let's see what's happening here. Mareko trades on E4, then plays F3. And Teresa Akin's playing it pretty aggressively by letting his e-pawn get isolated, I would say. Yes, actually. Um, Fairly aggressive choice. This feels correct for white. Um, so far, 
Yeah, knight d2, f5. Oh. Yeah. I can tell you um, a lot of bones in my body would be uh, trying to play if knight takes d2 <laughs> after knight d2. Yeah. <laughs> just, just real simple. Just Again, not... the simple solution, right? Trade it and castle and bring out the bishop on f8. Yeah, what no, I, I'm not trying to mess around here. And he goes um, f5, and then when white plays f3 again, he has an option to play the simple move, right? Pawn takes f3, and then castle queen side. Yep. I'm queen sure all your seven. bones would lean that way too. Yep. But he no. castles, it's isolates bad. his pawn, and indicates some desire to grab the pawn on a2, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bishop or takes who eight. knows? Maybe he'll play rook takes d4. You never know. Rook takes d4. You got me thinking about it now. Yeah. <laughs> takes, takes, takes. Queen. Oh, he oh! does it. He does it. Oh. He does His aggression it. level is through the roof, Amon. Dude, he had no... <laughs> like, he didn't care. He played that so quick. Uh, I, I was just enjoying that after knight takes d4, the queen doesn't have anywhere forward to go. Not d3, right. not c4, not b5, not h5, g4, f3, nowhere. So right. you have to go to d1. He's like, when I say retreat, you retreat, boy! <laughs> oh, man. This, uh, this looks like a lot of fun. Queen d1 is terrible. You can't castle right away. I like this. I don't think he's going to take it, quite honestly. You don't even think he'll take it? He'll just play like bishop g2 and say, hey, yeah. your rook's hanging, your e-pawn's hanging. I think he might. I don't need to take any risks. Or you could castle queenside here, but then, you know, bishop takes a2, just leaving the rook hanging. So, <laughs> yeah, possible. Probably bishop g2 is the safest move. I would take the rook. Whatever. Come on, man. Let's do it. Give me a rook. <laughs> you don't believe it? No, I don't believe it. All right. Queen d1. I was saying like rook d4 almost as a joke. Like, like you know, geometrically, there you could sort of play rook d4, but no. Okay, so probably bishop, what, bishop c5 and rook d8? Bishop a2, grabbing that pawn. <laughs> no, bishop c5 looks better, perhaps. Hey, man, I can't, can't knock you for bishop a2. Got to respect the guy who's willing to make a move like that. <laughs> you know, like, if you're willing to do that, honestly, that... Uh, honestly, that I'm just reading his feelings, you know? Like, when he played queen f7, I was like, he's looking at the a pawn, and I thought, but maybe he'll just sack his rook on d4 first. <laughs> we got one fan, one fan who likes this. One person in chat saying that this looks like a black win to them. Um, but this is the same guy who earlier in chat said, I won my first game, and after one move in my second game, my opponent resigned. Easy 2-0. So I yeah. have a feeling he may have been one of the Sao Paulo members, you know, mismatched. And uh -huh. if that's the case, I think that's clear uh, uh, honesty on his part. Because if he's playing for Sao Paulo and he's saying Black's winning, you know, he's yeah. winning the team there. Yeah. Um, but Wicked Lava is getting close to the upset, man. He's I, been, on that upset. I've been watching this and I've been enjoying it. Oh man, he's playing great. So far, he's opened up a big time advantage, which is yeah. nice to see. Frankly, yeah, maybe e4 would have provoked Black too much. I said, keep it, keep it calm. Don't let him see you're coming for him. And are these uh, rated games? <laughs> <laughs> So, Teresa Atkins having a big think between bishop c5 and bishop a2. I would say if you're going to sack a rook, you want to put some time pressure on your opponent too. You guys just bring out your pieces. Yeah, hang on a sec. How come he sacked the rook so fast, but he doesn't have a reply? <laughs> like, he doesn't have a next move. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I I mean, he's giving he's giving Mareko like four minutes to think about how to extricate yeah. And develop and everything. You don't do that, man. You don't give them a chance when you play like this. Uh, oh, and Mateus has lost. Wicked Lava. Boom. Scores the first point for Armenia, man. <laughs> it might everyone be the like, only point. Everyone was like, poor guy. He's outrated by 1,000 points. Now he's only outrated by 760 points. 
Yeah, his after, opponent lost a lot of rating for that. After taking 300 points from the guy. <laughs> and he's Armenia's high scorer. Let's go, Wicked Lava. He's Armenia's only scorer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Well, what do you think of Manukian's position before we turn back to our GMs? Um, amazing. I mean. Amazing, right? Uncontested oh, dark good. squares. Oh, my goodness. So fun. All because the guy didn't want to play an end game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to scare them with one part of your game to get the other part, right? Like, if you're yeah. if if you get good at like checkmating people, then you can scare them into the end game. And if you get good at the end game, then you can scare them into letting you checkmate them on G seven sure. <laughs> with a bishop and queen. Sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, let's see. I think that uh, that Terasakian played a move that you probably didn't even consider. I didn't consider it. He played G five. Was that on your radar at all? It, it was on my radar, but it wasn't near the forefront of my radar. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess it's the type of move I'd consider, but just not have the balls to play because it looks too slow, you know? Like, Good Lord, is it slow. It's like gl <laughs> This is like a glacial rucksack. Man, and like... Look at him like behind on the clock by three or four minutes. I mean, that means there's like no pressure on Mareko here. Well, because he's gonna if he plays rook d8, I'm wondering about just king c1, bishop king c1, c3. unpinning, defending b2 manually, and then just bishop c3, and then black can resign, right? What? And if bishop b2, just rook b1, and there's queen a7 coming next if you move the bishop back. So bishop b2, rook b1, bishop g7, queen a7, and then who's attacking who and how hard? Yeah, rook d8 looks what? like the only move. Um, what now is this? King, uh, king c1, yeah. I see a couple of people playing guess the move here, and I would suggest if you want to get a high guess the move score on this game, you should guess the moves for Mareko, but not for Teresa Hakian, because <laughs> Black's play is really unpredictable so far this game. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't know what to say about this. Uh, maybe uh, B okay B six. It's too slow. Style. It's too slow, man. There's no <laughs> way this works. This is the slowest rook sack I've seen in my life. I I mean, it's just off the charts. Do you play Bishop C three or or another move first? Honestly, it doesn't even matter. But yes, I would play Bishop C three. Bishop c3. Uh, I think that Black's also, since we've played b6, he's told me that it's it's okay to play the move g4. I think that he's going to take his time, play g4, you know, yeah. uh, c5 to stop my d4. I think you've probably got to take this bishop, but maybe not. I mean, if you play bishop f8, then g5 really was the slowest darn pointless thing you've ever done. Mm hmm. Bishop uh, h6? Bishop h6, maybe? Yeah, the problem I, that I was th seeing was like, um, I, I don't know, maybe like b3, king b2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be pretty nice organization for white. <laughs> um, okay, so he's thinking like king b2 to defend the pawn, bishop takes a2 to play queen b3, and then let's say we play knight d4. Oh, sorry, king b2, bishop a2, rook a2. Oh my gosh. You can't even you can't even take on a2 anymore. What? Okay. So it's going to be king b2, um yeah. most Resigns. likely queen d7, queen d7. Okay. To either play rook d2 or queen b5 and stop rook d1. In case okay. I wanted to trade pieces. All right. Okay. Um I don't know. 10 million ways to beat this. How about knight to d4? Right. Knight d4. And then the question, I guess, is how do you handle um, c5? c5? Yeah. Man, I almost like lose my will to like win when it's this easy. Um, <laughs> king c2? My plan was to trap the rook after c5. I don't know. If king, if queen f1 or king c2 is better, but something else has happened. 
rook to e1. Mm -hmm. So he's saying rook c3 basically has no threat at all. <laughs> like that it's just not a dangerous move. Right. Um, hmm. Not so sure after uh, after rook e The thing is that the queen moves, there's always this f2 move that you can throw in. Uh, I would seriously consider c5. Yeah. Just Maybe the next plan for white is rookie three, though, right? You have to play something. Oh, yeah, that's right. With a plan against rookie three. I mean, if, if, if he's still trying to play the game, I can't even tell if he's serious or joking here. Okay, so rookie three now. Queen yeah. takes c3. Yeah. <laughs> rook d3, queen d3, and you're just down a rook. Yeah. That's over. Straight up in the end game, white can play queen e3, hitting your bishop, your f pawn, and <laughs> then you probably trade queens. Uh, There's no way. Oh man, I wanted rook d4 to at least be like messy. Uh, rook e3 has just been played. Mareko must be like completely confused, man. He must be sitting there like, uh, are you sure? Because the thing is, if Rook takes e3, yeah. um, I can play either knight e3, queen c3, knight c2, yeah. or I can play queen e3, yeah. f2, king b2, which is yeah. stronger, I, I want to say. That's but, even what I expect, yeah. But one of the things that concerns me in that position is the idea of like bishop h3. Ah, Bishop H3 might might yeah, mess with... He, he takes with the... Uh, our happy times. He takes with the knight, and he's going to play knight back C2. Yeah, so that makes more sense. So now, if Bishop F5, he's going to play Rook B1. Okay, so now Black's got three pawns against a Rook. Right. If Bishop F5, I think Rook B1 can be played. Um, there might be some perpetual ideas, but... I can't believe it. All right, so it would go like bishop c2, queen c2, queen e1, king b2. And maybe f. f2 no. is what we would have to hope for, I think. Yeah, but I queen f5 at least stops the queen, and then you can sort of come up with the next move. Right. Well, he's down to 17 seconds, and he's played bishop c4. Instead of f5. Okay, so rook b1, at least bishop a2. He's going to keep taking pawns. I respect that. Yeah, I mean, there's some number of pawns where... Queen d4, take and f2, right? Queen d4, trade, f2, yeah. So uh, if you're white, the question is, what do you play? Um, do you play a4 to play rook a3? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> that looks good because if queen e3, bishop d3 maybe is weird. Or maybe not. No, oh, he does this anyway. Yeah, queen d2 would be other would be another place to come from. Queen d2. I'm surprised he didn't take that pawn on a2. I definitely would have grabbed it. You know, may as well. Yeah. Yeah. I told you if you're playing guess the move, don't guess Teresa Hawkins' moves. A5. Surprising. What What's also surprising is that the game still bears analysis, even after he's played this many surprising moves. Yep. Yeah, he's going to play G4. Yep. <laughs> the Rook's covering F2. <laughs> it, might, it might be a little much, buddy. Knight to E3. Yeah, Knight to E3 now, or King D2. Oh, King, that's that's dirty. Okay, that's a head scratcher, man. What a weird game. That's a head scratcher. I was I was also gonna say, like during the opening phase, that sometimes Petrov players show surprising aggression. <laughs> yeah, with a timid opening. Given that it's known as this like opening to draw, but then, but then, you know, they like there are all the... these lines where once White doesn't. Take a draw, black like plays like f5 kind of moves, like in that yeah. game. Anyway, the Armenia Eagles are on the board. 
Uh, they've got eight points against the Capybara 16. <laughs> two of them came from our friend uh, Wicked Lava, who, who just won 2-0 against uh, Mateus. Two of them from Wicked Lava. And uh, I, you know, Teresa Hawkins having a think, maybe changing approaches for next game. And we're going to take a 90-second break. And then we'll be back with, uh, with the second uh, clash, or not clash, between Teresa Hawkins and Mareko. All right, welcome back everybody to the Armenia Eagles versus Sao Paulo Capybaras here in week two of Division C. And uh, we are having a look at Last Gladiator versus Artak Manukian, manager of the Armenia Eagles. Right. Playing board two for the Eagles, NM versus NM. And... Uh, so they drew their first game. They drew their first game despite a great position for Manukian. We didn't see the details of how that went down. It's funny because now he's got the same position. He's missing his dark square bishop, and his opponent has this crazy strong bishop on d4. Yeah, he's trying the other side of it. At least here he can block the bishop with like a knight on e5. In the other game, Black had just no dark square control, like zero nothing. Yeah. Um, well, if I'm white, I expect knight e5 happening. So yeah. I want to play knight e2, bishop c3, knight d4, and try to play knight e6 or knight c6. And That'll help checkmate, yeah. Really cement that guy in there. Uh, apart from that, then I think with the bishop on c3, guarding b2 frees up all my rooks to just shift over, whereas right now they're a little yeah. tied up. So if you get a situation where you've got a knight on e6, white, black's got a knight on e5, your rooks go to like, you know, the F and E or F and G files or something. And then you're ready to just go like F4 and like, boom, just. Yeah. H pawn also, I think is a hero here. H4 at any time of day looks very strong. Uh, yeah. Just, just poke at that. Weaken the Black King's shelter. Mm -hmm. Queen on H6 looks good too. Cause it's like, how are you going to get rid of her? Like yep. she might as well just come in contact with all those squares that she wants. Agreed. Yeah. No, this is uh a game for like the thing about f4 and it's just I, I feel like more preparation could have gone into this right um, it's, it's my so good but he needed a little bit more deep tie on gosh <laughs> yes he would handle the uh, gosh deep tie -in would handle this position like a, an absolute pro yeah you would you would you would tag him in here for white um all right um Teresakian has started moving and uh wow his f pawns already moved all the way up to f5 that was fast so yeah we can say um i guess he didn't move for about two two and a half minutes in his game uh the, yeah. at the start so i can you see just went to the bathroom or something but he's back now and uh he looks like he didn't forget how to sacrifice things <laughs> no he's right back at it he's right back at it <laughs> 
boom f6 hello my goodness this one looks more sound than the rook you mean because he still has both of them <laughs> well i mean it's only one pawn and like he's got a legitimate threat here to play like knight g4 or f5 or something right yeah um i mean just in general like it seems like a pretty legitimate attack. There's no piece within a stone's throw of the Black King. No, no, th this is a crushing, like, this is over. Um, knight takes d5, knight f5, knight g4, all threats. Rook g8 to try to play rook g6 is unfortunate that uh, rook g8 is the only self-checkmating move. Um, like, after knight takes d5, queen h6 is actually mate, whereas in other, for, after other moves, it's not checkmate. So yeah. you have king g8 to play. But Maybe on knight d5, you could play rook g6. I mean, rook g8 also allows queen f7 to e6. We'll see what... Oh, he did play rook g8. We'll see yeah. what Tarasakian does. I'm hoping he does not play queen h6. Normally, that's very exciting to play, you know, queen h6, king yeah. h, knight f5 and stuff. But after one rook takes d4, I don't need... Um, if the rook was on f3, I totally support it. Yeah. Um, but queen f7, by the way, is also like... I don't know, pretty strong move. Yeah. Queen f7, rook g7, and then queen takes e6, or queen h5. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, queen takes e6. This has to be right. This just collapses Black's structure. The knight comes to d5 or f5 next move. Doesn't matter too much. <laughs> so I, th I think he, he probably looked at his last game and said, well, you know, like, it's great to be on the initiative, great to be on the attack. Actually, it all kind of went well. I just was missing a rook in the final position. So he... Yeah. He thought, well, if I just sack a couple pawns, maybe instead, that's the better way to do it. Yep. This is All right. so crushing. So, tempting options for white include knight f5 and queen f5 e6. For some reason, it doesn't l look right, but it's popping into my head as like a thing you could do. Queen f5 followed by e6? Yeah. But mm -hmm. black will just take on e3, so yeah, let's not do that. So if bishop takes f6, um, knight g4, probably is his plan. Knight g4, bishop uh, g5. Oh, and then the queen can come defend h6. Right. That's not exactly what we want, is it? Um, I was thinking just knight f5, it stops rook e7, and you're just try trying to take on h6. But actually after knight g4, bishop g5, h4 might win for white. H4, bishop c1. Oh, and then you get your queen to h4, you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Dirty, dirty. I know. Not I wanted to nice. throw in queen h6 check, you know, before recapturing on c1, but that would have had even <laughs> worse results. <laughs> where, where did we see that? Oh, we saw that earlier when I was saying queen f2 in that other game, and the bishop on f1 takes on b5, but it still yeah. covers f1. Square. It still covers f1. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Bishops. Um, yeah, knight never G5, know where they're knight f5 all look like great moves. Uh, there's also the possibility to like throw in queen f5 check and then take something so that h6 is hanging. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but it's just white to play basically. Oh, okay, knight g4, bishop g5. So we let's do see knight g4. We don't yet know why, but uh, there it is. Maybe he wants to just play queen f5 check after that and uh, knight takes h6 or just knight takes h6 immediately. Oh, yeah, you could just take on h6 with the knight. I mean, it's kind of in the way of the queen, but I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it was a little in the way. Actually, kind of a weird hero is the uh, knight on e1 covering uh, g2, right? It's just like weird uh, geometry, but it's really helpful in the lower lines. Yeah, you do need you do need that somewhere. Maybe... Rook f7 is another thought in response to bishop um, g5. Okay. Kind of, you know, trying to whittle away at the king's defenses. And in some cases, there'd be like a tactic on d7 since the black queen is wanting to come to g5 or h4. So let's say queen g8. Yeah, queen g8. Bishop takes g5. Queen f7, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Queen h6, king g8. Yeah, I'm just barely hanging on. And on the plus side, he's managed to lose a rook. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be par for the course for him. You know, and then, I don't know. Okay, bring this the knight, can't be right. Bring the knight to f3, and it's a mess. 
you know. So on I'm, this one, I was curious about bishop takes uh, g5, queen yeah. g5, okay, and queen d7, rook g7. Yeah. Do I get out of that? Because if uh, if rook g7, knight f6, there's queen takes f6. Yeah. And yeah, this is what I was. Wouldn't sure. want that. Let's see what's happening. Oh, okay, that's all happening. All of that has happened. That's the move I needed to see. I, I I was like, it looks a little weird, but rook f7 is right. Uh, There's rook f7, and now you know, among other things, h3 would be enough for white. Um, perhaps no reason not to throw a knight f3, given that that's uh, completely winning. Yeah. Now, not knight e5 though. Now you don't want to play knight e5. That would be. Yeah, at the, at, I mean, mistake. You know, queen g2 is checkmate, even if the piece defending it is pinned. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And the rook on f7 is attacked, so it's time to do something okay. about that. Knight h4. Queen f7. Oh, okay. yeah, as you just said. <laughs> yeah. As you just said. Um, knight e5, no good. If we take, take. Hmm. Hmm, indeed, That's... I think uh, I think knight f3 actually didn't work out. How is that possible? That's like the weirdest. It took his eye off of g2, which in this case was the ball. The ball game is on g2. So, I mean... Correct would have been any move like h3 or knight f2 or something. Right. Yeah, queen g6. That Not should sure go in a recommend here. <laughs> that should go in like tactics trainer as like a tactic, you know, because like you don't have as many of those like defensive tactics where you're like you cover things and then oh, you're winning things in response. Right. So rook f1, just seeding the thing on f7. Let's see, if queen f7, he can play knight g5, then take on f7 with his rook. All right. If rook f7, he'll also play knight g5. And then queen takes g5 is not good. hg5, rook f7. Maybe white's still okay after losing the piece, huh? <laughs> that almost seems unfair. I'm not sure what seems unfair. It's like yeah. one side is making a comeback here. Hard to tell. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, does Marika have anything better than taking a rook on f7? It's hard to imagine. Um, h5, though, maybe, could be looked at. Right. I don't know. It seems like if you can't take the knight that you've got already hanging, <clears throat> what more are we waiting for? Maybe take on c3. Um, well, actually, at, at this point, I think if queen... I'm trying to play like a sneaky move, like a knight. No, there's, not, there's nothing... There's nothing for me here. I have to play this rook of seven. You have to? I think. Okay. Was white threatening anything? Oh, he took with the queen. Well, he is going to play the end game. Rook f7, rook g7. Uh -huh. He's going to block with rook g7, and then on knight f6, queen f6. Exactly. Well, I didn't see any threat for white. I don't know why black couldn't have traded on c3 before going for all this. Um, does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter much. Because you do get the, yeah, I mean, like, takes, knight takes um, at the end as well. Hmm. Okay, so are we seriously going to have, like, an equal material endgame after this craziness? That seems uh, a bit ridiculous. <laughs> Um, someone's asking if white's 2000. No, these players are both <laughs> rated over 2600 feet. A these are just um chess.com rapid ratings, which get set to 2199 before the match in order to allow them to play in these fan club matches, right? 
because 2200 is the, uh, the limit. Capybara is still with a 32 to 16 lead. And I believe that 31 was the number of points needed or, you know, 30.5 was the number of points needed to win the match. So I think, although there's a number of games still going, probably like 13 or 14 games still going, I think the Capybaras have just clinched this match. Right. Um, so that's a great week for them. That's a six out of six week. Mm-hmm. And uh, that'll move them up to eight points and first place in the division, I think. Wow. Yep, that sounds right. Fixing my bracket for me somehow. <laughs> Although I still think the Wizards will somehow come out ahead next week. Okay, H4. Interesting. Queen G6, I think, have to. More weird moves. I mean, he could play Rook F7 as well, no? Oh, no, because then Queen F7, Queen G7, Knight F6. Oh, yeah, no, he did queen g6, and okay, again, I can throw an h5, but I'm not sure if it's worth it. He's going to go queen f5 here, or what? Uh-huh, queen g6. Ah, queen g6, knight f6, king mm -hmm. g7, takes, knight takes d5, and at least we're pretending with an extra pawn. Oh, yeah, with an extra pawn. Hey! And here I was thinking he was trying to keep queens on the board because he wanted to keep the attack going somehow, even in the end game. I mean, the black king lacks cover a little bit compared to the white king, so I was thinking he just wants to keep queens on the board. That's possible too, but after queen g6, I don't think you have a choice. Okay. Well, I was thinking he could go like knight f6, king g7, knight h5, king back uh -huh. to h7, and then queen whatever, d7 or something, or d5. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Hey, he's still up a pawn that way too, but with the with the queen. I predict he's not going to trade queens. Well, <laughs> Mariko doesn't even allow it. <laughs> hey, that was a good prediction. Good prediction. Okay. Knight f6, knight e7, uh, guard c8, which is a nasty checking square. Right. I mean, knight f6, that's a, that's a horrible threat, so we're going to see something from him. Knight e7, that looks right. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. I think it made sense to retreat the king, actually, because in those other lines we were looking at, he was losing a pawn. Right. And honestly, part of White's problem is that his queen needs to defend the knight on g4. That's part of why White's having trouble fighting for d3, d4, d5 squares. Mm -hmm. So leaving that on the board is Thank logical. He'll come back with check. I don't think there's another move. Yeah. If the queen had blocked on g8, maybe he could trade and play knight f6. Knight takes d5, one of the end games you'd suggested. Uh, if the queen blocks on g8, I think you'd take and take h6 with check. Take h6 then... instead to get the connecteds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Queen e6. Okay, so he really wants this knight, knight f6. He's making knight f6 the threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, Knight f6, king g6, knight e8, and knight f6, king h8, queen e8 all lead to mate or queen something good. Mm -hmm. So that is a real threat. Also, if I can play h5 and knight f6, that's another sort of little box I can try to put you in. Maybe the black king can survive on g5. Uh, which one? Like, let's say I take on c3 for black here. <laughs> Yeah, but it's that I play knight f6 and knight e8 check. No, oh, you're just going to go to e8 instead of h5. Or but... Boring, boring. <laughs> Come on. All right, so um, how do we stop knight f6? Or is there a way to move the queen so that on knight f6 you can play king g7? Maybe that's an appropriate approach. But if we move the queen, then there's queen takes h6. Hmm. hmm. Tough spot. Right. And just to say, the, um, the match is heavily in favor of the uh, Capybaras here. They've, they've won the match officially, like mm -hmm. uh, even mathematically. There's no way for Armenia to come back. Yeah. Um, and it, it did look that way based on the mismatches. However, it wasn't a, it wasn't a total stomp or, or anything like that. Yeah. All right. So Queen F8 was the only way to get the king a safe square on G7 without hanging H6. And uh, Teresa Hakian grabs that center pawn and, and keeps keeps playing here. And takes back with the pawn uh, on c3, which is really nice. 
was dominating that night on C6. Yeah. I would estimate White's chances of winning reasonably high. Um, you know, the extra pawn plus some attacking potential. Right. Uh, one thing that I would like to play, I'm not sure if it works, is I was going to say queen e6. And if queen h4, knight f6. I'm not sure if that's working. Mm -hmm. it seemed like it was close because somehow I'm covering my uh, checks. Right. He's got to do it all pretty fast. Tarsakian does not have a lot of time to work with here. Right. I'm surprised he didn't at least think about a queen c8 check there. Try to maybe take b7 with check. At least uh, see what your opponent's doing after that check. Because then you could come back to f5 after. Like queen c8, knight d8, and then maybe queen f5. And then queen f5. And say the knight's not better on, on uh, d8. Although maybe the knight would come to f7 and be okay, <laughs> okay. to be okay with the side. Yeah. Knight on f7 is a very good defender. Queen d1, king h2, knight g4, king g3. You always have to calculate like every check in these positions, right? Because like you could randomly get yeah. tactic or mated, right? Out of anywhere. Yeah. No, he's going to go defensive. Knight uh, here, king f8 now. Only move that doesn't lose. And queen c8. And this is nasty. King e7 gets mated by knight g8. That's made in one. So he's got to play something to d8. Block. Yeah. He's got yeah. a block. And he trades queens. Yeah, it should be a winning end game, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, with that pass pawn. As long as you bring the king out, play g4. Just use that pawn as a decoy and go to the queen side. Mm -hmm. So probably king g3, king f3, or g4, king g3, king f3. Some of those. Some of those moves. Uh, he's been pretty much 15 seconds the whole time, so he's doing well down on the clock, handling it. Yeah, that's true. He is handling it so far. Stopping b5. Nice. He was alert to that. Yeah, this is good. Okay, so now on knight d4, he couldn't go to e3 because of knight f5. King f4. So now he's got the idea of maybe bringing his king to e5, which would be quite good, I think. E4 here, yeah. Just make that pawn uh, pass yeah. pawn first. Yep. Depending on the position, maybe h5 first if you want the absolute outside pass pawn. Uh huh. Ooh, he wants knight f5. Is that too much? <laughs> yeah, I I feel like I would have done it with just the one pawn, but. Oh, God, the speed is so important. Now Black's got an A pawn that you can't deal with. Well, knight d4, and knight c2, or knight b5 does handle it briefly. Yeah. I think he's still fine here. Yeah, so knight, mm, maybe b5. Oh, I've messed up so many of these knight endgames. I play them against uh, the computer. To, like practice my like night end game yeah play which is absolutely terrible and i've messed these up so many times that when i see that a pawn fall i already see like you know 12 of my own disasters pop up in my <laughs> in my memory oh no the knight's got to go to a three now it's like very hard but now you can bring the king maybe to the queen side i'm not sure like not immediately but maybe indirectly yeah this is real good because now g6, g7 is a big threat. Actually, g6, g7 might just be winning now. g7, king mm -hmm. h7, king f7. Knight d8 check. Yeah, I think h6 is probably the, the safe move. Might need to be played first, yeah. Yeah, that's and, good. And it's a little bit tugtwangy as well, right? Mm-hmm. Because knight is already kind of where it wanted to be. He did it. Yeah, he did it. Uh, super good technique. Bravo. Bravo. So they split 1-1. One, one. I, I really enjoyed the match between these two. Wow. Right on. He All sacrifices right. in both games. <laughs> Ter Sahakian. We thought he would get a quick knockout. He almost did. He almost did. And then uh, Mareko had that 
fabulous defensive move queen to g6 right like sort of like the defensive move that wins back a piece while your own king's getting hammered yeah that was that was a pretty crazy move there and uh that that got us a whole extra phase to the game um so i can continue working on my abysmal night end games by studying that one yeah and that's it that's all the chess we have for today Come on, that's yeah. it. The last pawn has been queened. Yeah, yeah. It looks like uh, the match is still finishing, only to give us an official score. But uh, it's it's uh, over. So Sao Paulo is taking um, uh, the the lion's share of the points today. Six points. Yeah. So big week for them. Six points. Let's see if I can remember what that does to the standings. Sao Paulo came into this week with two points, right? So they're at eight. So they've got eight points. Moscow probably has seven points. Um, and then... The standings are on the screen. Are those updated? Mumbai and the six. Eagles have three points, maybe. Eight, seven... Well, the standings are on the screen, so I don't want to look like a genius. Okay, uh, you go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, it's just that I, I feel like you're working really hard, and I, <laughs> I could have pretended like I was doing math with you and just been like, oh, I think it's a three, six, seven, and eight. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't right. have it in me. You would have been right. <laughs> yep. All right. So it is eight, seven, six, three. Um, so... A good week from Teresa Hockey and keeps Armenia from being eliminated despite losing that, that important right. match against uh, the Capybaras. Right. Now we've got Capybaras with eight points. Great week from Mareko. Um, and another great week from, from Moscow. So I don't know, has this changed your feelings about which teams are going to finish first and second in this division next week? What, what, what are you looking forward to next week? Yeah, I think um, I just didn't. Uh, one thing I didn't really know a lot about was the uh, Sao Paulo fan club team. I thought, okay, these guys are like pretty much new to the to the league. Um, I wasn't sure what kind of fan club they were going to have. Turns right. out they have a huge fan club. Um, huge. So uh, I was always uh, uh, in favor of Morocco. I thought he was going to do well in the knockouts. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I had known that that their club would have been uh, coming out like this, then I would have picked them as an easy go through. Uh, and then my other pick would have been uh, the Wizards, which, which it was. Um, so I did pick the Wizards and Armenia to, to go through the group, but uh, we'll see. It's still possible. But um, yeah, after seeing this, the club and how many members turned out and, and how strong the, the, the club is, uh, I definitely think that Sao Paulo uh, is a huge favorite to go through. Cool. Yeah, so um, so that's what we'll see next week. Sao Paulo will go up against the Mumbai Movers. That'll be that'll be huge for those two teams. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, it's still it's still anybody's game in this division. But uh, the Eagles will need a big week to catch up. It would need a, a six point week to get into the playoffs next week. Um, but also, if they could get to third place, they could get to the fan vote, which is better than fourth place. Um, with that, we're going to turn things over to uh, Mr. Canty with the uh, post-game show. And uh, we're going to raid him over there. And awesome. uh, yeah, uh, Mon, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I like I said, I really enjoyed the little mini match we got between uh, Mareko and Teresa Haikin at the end there. And uh, otherwise, it was it was great to see so many fans turn up for all the clubs today. We actually had some pretty big matches, which uh, was a lot different than uh, the very first match that we called together. So it's great to see that over the course of the uh, summer series, people are realizing, oh, you know, like this is happening. This, these are the times they're starting to really show up to, to every match. And I think that's really great to see. Yeah, that's right. It's building. All right. Um, so we will see you guys again later. Enjoy the post-match show. Bye, guys.